Okay, it's 5.30. The July 10, 2023 regular meeting of the Malibu City Council is now called to order on account of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. This meeting is being held in a hybrid format that allows members of the public to participate in person or remotely via Zoom webinar. In person participants, if you would like to speak, please submit your request to speak form to the clerk. Remote participants, if you would like to speak, please join the Zoom webinar meeting printed on the agenda and raise your hand in Zoom when the item you wish to speak on is called. May we please have a roll call? Councilmember Grisanti? Here. Councilmember Riggins? Here. Councilmember Stewart? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Uring? Here. Mayor Silverstein? Here. You have a quorum. Okay, thank you. We have no speaker cards. Are there any Zoom participants who'd like to speak on the closed session items? No, we don't have any participants or raised hands in Zoom. Thank you. That'll close public participation for the closed session portion of this. We will now recess to closed session to discuss, to discuss the items listed on the closed session agenda. We will reconvene at 6.30 p.m. or as soon thereafter as we are available to begin the regular session and hear the closed session report. We are in recess. You did very nicely.
Okay. The July 10, 2023 regular meeting of the Malibu City Council is now called back to order on account of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. This meeting is being held in a hybrid format that allows members of the public to participate in person or remotely via Zoom webinar. In-person participants, if you'd like to speak, please submit your request to speak form to the clerk. Remote participants, if you'd like to speak, please join the Zoom webinar meeting, print it on the agenda, and raise your hand in Zoom when the item you wish to speak on is called. Maybe please have a roll call. Councilman Rigersanti? Here. Councilman Riggins? Here. Councilman Stewart? Here. Mayor Pro Temuri? Here. Mayor Silverstein? I am here as well. You have a quorum. Thank you. Marianne, would you like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance tonight? Fisher Hurricane? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God. Thank you very much. Trevor, can we please have a closed session report? Yes, at 5.30 p.m., the City Council met in open session and then recessed to closed session for the items listed on the posted agenda. All five council members were present and no reportable action was taken. Thank you very much, Trevor. Um, Kelsey, can we have a report on the posting of the agenda, please? The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on June 30th, 2023. Great, thank you for that. And may we please have an approval of the agenda. I'll move to approve the agenda. I'll second. Roll call, please. Mayor Pro Temuri? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Gersanti? Yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Mayor Silverstein? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, that takes us to item 1A. We have a community services department update from our director. Kristen Florgers. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, Mayor Silverstein and members of the City Council. I think, um, Parker, if you could get our presentation up, that would be great. Um, we are excited to give the Council a presentation on your Community Services Department as we are already 10 days into celebrating Parks and Recreation Month. Uh, Parks and Recreation is an integral part of the community and throughout the country, and including in the city of Malibu. The department encourages physical activity, healthy lifestyles, educational, and mental well-being. Uh, this year's theme, as you can see on the screen, is uh, where community grows, and this is a national recognized theme. Um, this department will celebrate this theme through a social media campaign this month as we highlight parks, programs, the environment, partnerships, and staff. So we want to thank the council for allowing us to show you what we love to do and how we support the Malibu community. So let's start. So this is our vision statement for our department. We adopted this vision statement during our um, Parks and Recreation Master Plan, and we promote and share this vision statement with our staff, and which gives us a focus on how we program our uh, programs and um, how we move forward with our department. I wanted to give you some metrics here as part of our department. As you can see, we have pretty high numbers on the number of participants, almost over 2,500 children ages 2 to 14 uh, participate in our programs in a calendar year. We offer 745 programs. Just our senior center alone has over 1,700 hours of service. And through uh, our arts programs, we uh, recognize over 295 artists through the year. Our parks and facilities, we have six parks in, in the city of Malibu, spanning from Las Flores Creek Park all the way to Charmley Wilderness Park. We have um, 610 acres of gardens and native habitats. Every year we have about 220 new plantings of pollinator plants, and we process over 100 facility rentals annually, and this provides an opportunity for anyone in our community to use our facilities for programs, celebrations, such as birthday parties, athletic competitions, those sorts of things. Um, our staff here is behind me, um, and we'll recognize them later on in the presentation, but um, I'll next move on to uh, Kate Menisco. He'll talk about our recreation services. 
Good evening, members of City Council. My name is Kate Menisco. I'm the Recreation Manager for the Community Services Department. Um, so we've divided our recreation services into eight sections, as you see on the screen. Um, our department hosts an after-school program partnership with the Boys and Girls Club of Malibu, where we offer three weekly after-school programs, as well as workshops um, for members of the Boys and Girls Club, as well as general students. Um, the department has a master facility use agreement with the school district in which we operate all of the aquatic programming at Malibu High School. It includes youth water polo, swim team, aqua aerobics, lap swim, as well as learn to swim lessons. We offer a division in recreation known as community classes, which are weekly enrichment, parent and me, and adult programs. Um, most of those are held at Malibu Bluffs Park. And very big right now, we offer a summer day camp program during the Santa Monica Malibu Unified Spring Break and Summer Break, um, where we are offering surf, skate, enrichment, and sport camps to the Malibu community throughout the summer. Um, for our senior division, we operate the Malibu Senior Center here out of City Hall. Um, we offer art educational lectures, excursions, fitness, monthly luncheons, and social activities for our senior population. Um, we are also programming um, learn to skate programs and skate camps at the temporary skate park located at Malibu Bluffs Park year round. Um, in our sports division, we coordinate adult softball leagues, youth and middle school sports programs, as well as open gym basketball. And we've listed a few of our special events here in the special events division that our department programs, including Breakfast with Santa, Chumash Day, Cine Malibu Movies in the Park, our Halloween Carnival, and our annual Tiny Tot Olympics. And next up is Chris Orris, our Recreation Supervisor, to talk about our park and environmental programs. Good evening, uh, members of the City Council. Um, so our next slide. As you all know, the City of Malibu has a strong focus on environmental sustainability. And so with that, we have an earth-friendly management policy. That does cover our, our integrated pest management and on all city properties, including uh, the City Hall here. We do not use any pesticides, herbicides, or any synthetic chemicals. We only use organic um, materials so that we make sure that our ecosystems and the parks as a whole are welcome to everybody and we don't have any um, negative impact on the community and the environment, which is great. The Mayor's Monarch Pledge, we've been hosting that for a few years where we are a part of a group that promises to provide habitat and programs and outreach education for the public to encourage the growth and the population of monarchs in our area. We also have an outdoor recreation program where we enhance the um, programs, the outreach, the education for the public at all of our different parks through different classes and workshops. We're gonna be hosting some new ones this fall, which we're excited about. For our park maintenance, Daily, we have staff that visit all of our parks. They open, they close, and they also oversee to make sure that everything is run smoothly. We also have not only the six parks, but we also have two vacant properties, the Heathercliff property and the Trancas Canyon uh, field that we oversee. And we also oversee the medians and the areas around the Civic Center Way, where uh, a great number of the public get to visit. Um, the park maintenance also includes the contractors overseeing the landscape maintenance, the custodial, and security. The um, preventative maintenance that we do occurs all year round and uh, happens at all of our facilities. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. All right. Just a few more slides here. So we um, also provide opportunities for the community to give us feedback. Uh, currently, we have uh, a, two forms online on our um, at malibucity.org backslash parks, which people can provide um, community interest survey and feedback regarding our programs. 
Um, during our last Parks and Recreation Commission meeting, our Recreation Coordinator, Amanda Regali, provided the Commission with an update on our senior population. And when we were doing that research, we noticed, I think this was brought up here at Council as well, that we do have an aging population here in the City of Malibu. So we will be focusing on um, kind of bringing new opportunities and programs to our senior population as it grows. We offer wellness and mindful activities as um, sometimes this is overlooked in parks and recreation, but we understand the importance of providing nature walks and those sorts of programs to ensure that the people are getting outside and, and being healthy in their mind and mental well-being. And just a broad community uh, benefit, we do offer volunteerism, um, sidewalk CPR, first aid, those sorts of programs as well. And then I just wanted to provide you just with some photos of some of the programs we offer. We have Chumash Day as a special event. Cinema Malibu we offer uh, throughout the summer, once a month with the outdoor movie screen, surf camp, after school programming, uh, sports of all sorts, uh, tennis up at the high school, music, mental wellness with yoga, art exhibitions dog obedience classes. Um, in our senior, senior center, we offer chair yoga with a timed for meditation and relaxation art programs. And at the top there, that's um, cartooning. So that's just a glimpse of kind of what our program, the programs that we offer. Under the community services department, we also have three commissions under our department. Arts Commission, Parks and Rec Commission, and the Youth Commission. Uh, programs are anywhere from art exhibitions out in the uh, gallery, poet laureate programs, um, just park operations, and then we offer leadership opportunities for our Youth Commission as well. Just to highlight our team that's sitting here with me. Um, I've been with the city since 2006, but new to the director position. So I'm excited to lead our team here of staff who are so dedicated and, and love what they do. Uh, you met Kate Menisco earlier. She's been with the city since 2006 as well. She is an excellent project manager. We love Kate and projects. And she uh, manages mostly all of our recreation division and part-time staff. Uh, Chris is so knowledgeable on <laughs> environmental um, habitats, eco ecology, all sorts of things. He is a wealth of knowledge. His, if you haven't talked to Chris, you will find something to talk to him about. He does. He's been all over the world. He's, he's amazing, but we're glad to have him on board. Uh, Drew and Danny aren't here tonight, but they they manage our parks for our department. Um, you've probably seen them out there working, fixing temporary skate park, but they're um, our two parks people. That's all we have full time in our department. Brittany here is our uh, eyes and ears. She is our frontline staff manager who helps with phone calls, website. She pretty much knows everything that we're doing. So uh, she's very a key player to our department. Lauren Davis has been with us and Amanda since 2022. Um, since they've started working for the city, they've gained some certifications. Um, Lauren is up at our pool. She does sports programs and uh, and on the side, she does some skydiving. <laughs> Adriana has been with the city um, for over 10 years. She worked part time and moved her way up. She's also been an instructor for us. So she kind of has a well knowledgeable kind of round understanding of, of what we do and how to serve our community. And then Amanda is in our senior center and uh, helps out with arts programming. And um, Amanda gives a lot of care and concern to our seniors that couldn't do it without her. And then our part-time staff, this is our kind of our backbone of our department. We have over maybe 60 part-timers that work for us at one time from uh, recreation assistants who sit at the front office at the um, Michael Landon Center to lifeguards at our community pool and then uh, park maintenance assistants who are out there hand weeding and just doing general park maintenance. So. 
Um, these are how you can get a hold of us. We are here at City Hall and as well at Bluffs Park. Bluffs Park is seven days a week and uh, we are open pretty much 8 a.m. to sunset at uh, Bluffs Park. Our email, csd at malibucity.org. The phone number is at the Bluffs Park office, which is uh, monitored seven days a week. Our um, website, malibucity.org backslash community services, and we also have a presence on social media. And then, well, in closing, we're just going to provide you with a video of uh, the community services department. Mm. There was sound. <laughs> Get the visual. <laughs> To learn more about programs and parks, visit <laughs> malibucity.org forward slash community services. Um, that video is at malibucity.org backslash community services on the front page if you're interested in seeing it. And it will also be on social media throughout the month. And that concludes our presentation. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Kristen. Everybody, looks like a great place to live. Anybody have any comments? I just want to be that little kid that was on the skateboard. I want to, I want to do that. No, you guys are great. Uh, just keep up the great work and really appreciate all the hard work that you do. Thank you. Really appreciate everything you guys do. And uh, people want things to do. And you guys are fulfilling our desires. Thank you so much. Fulfilling our desires. <laughs> Very good, very good. You did a great job. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, so that takes us now to 2A, communications from the public concerning matters which are not on the agenda. Remote participants, please raise your hand in Zoom if you'd like to speak on this item. I do not have any speaker slips. Okay, is there anybody on Zoom? There are two speakers. First is Craig Hill, followed by Ryan. Let's hear from Craig. Hi, good evening, council and staff. I, I was able to delay the thing I mentioned just long enough to put in a word now, and then I'll watch the rest of the meeting later. Uh, three quick thoughts. The adult softball league is really fun to play in, but sadly there weren't enough signups for the league this season. Maybe we need better outreach from the ample staff, maybe even in time for the second season that's supposed to start later in the summer. Second, I hope you can provide some clarity on and take definite action on State Senate Bill 423, which would make it much easier to develop multifamily housing in Malibu. It appears to be on track to pass the assembly and be signed into law by Governor Newsom. Please coordinate with any and all of the bill's opponents, which include the League of California Cities, most or all maybe of the other COG cities and the Coastal Commission. And here you might have an opportunity to improve the city's relationship with Coastal and working side by side. Third, when I approached council in 2019 about implementing municipal code section 2.36.110, which provides for an expense stipend for planning commissioners, this body said, okay, well, we don't have enough money now. Let's do it when we can afford it. I believe the city now has a surplus of something like $30 million, making the annual total for all five commissioners $15,000, a drop in the bucket. It's also time to revisit the matter because staff has implicitly acknowledged it's a good idea in the three rationales they've given for increasing the city manager's compensation in, in a separate item tonight, which by the way, it does sound like a good idea. The three rationales for that are one, that the cost of living has increased, including for vehicle miles. Well, commissioners have site visits to make, the price of gas has gone up, plus our opportunity costs for all the time we devote has gone up too. Second, 
the manager should be paid comparably to other comparable cities, well, so then should the commission. Other comparable cities, including those in the COG, do pay the statutory stipend in amounts ranging from $150 to $1,097 per commissioner per month. My recommendation of $250 per commissioner per month is below average. Uh, and third rationale, that the city manager is now more valuable in understanding the community, having spent a few years here. And I'm sure that's true. Well, we commissioners have over 200 years of local residence between the five of us. So staff's reasoning would suggest we're pretty valuable too. Finally, I believe that a total appropriation of $15,000 is below the threshold where you'd even need to make any formal adjustment to the budget or the work plan. Or if that threshold is still at 15,000 exactly as it was a few years ago, then you could set the total amount at 14,875 and I just forego a check for one meeting. So please honor the thinking that staff did in regard to the city manager's compensation and do what a prior council said would be done by now. And with that, I'll see you at all at City Hall next week. Thank you. Take care, all. Thank you, Craig. Ryan? Yes, I want to uh, continue to draw your attention to the illegal antenna pole that's in front of Santa Monica College on Civic Center Way. It's violated the conditions of approval of this city and is different than everything that it was explaining over several years to the public in, in pre-meetings. And the EIR for this project was done by the school district itself. And you know this idea that an antenna uh, structure was gonna be part of the project got manipulated and we ended up with the worst thing possible, an illegal poll. So I would like to hear an update at every meeting of this city council from the staff as to the progress, um, unless I can see that the poll has already been removed. Um, that's number one. The second is I wanted to mention in general that over the years, the city council has heard many renewals for various service contracts in the meetings of, of June, July, um, which is a bad annual cycle. It conflicts with a lot of the budget preparation demands of the city. Um, it conflicts with the blackout dates of, uh, of whether the council is going to meet or not. And I think you ought to start issuing some 13 or 14 month contracts so that these don't all come due um, because they don't seem to be getting the full attention that they deserve in getting the best value for taxpayers money and having a varied supply of contractors at the city's disposal. Uh, most recently at your last meeting, the council was basically forced to take a sole bid uh, and pay whatever um, you know, was proposed by the staff because there really was no other option. So we need a better value-centered approach. The council gave clear direction a year ago, and I think a year before that, it was a different council, but the, the theme is always the same from the council is we need to do a better job of making this a transparent process that all the criteria that staff uses to evaluate the bids is above board, it's explained that there's a ranking, um, and that all of the bids are provided and open to the public. And most notably, one I, I suggest you pull tonight uh, did not disclose the amounts of the bidders. And I think it's inappropriate and that you should continue that item, which is uh, 3B12 in particular. And I'll note that several others on your consent calendar, which is an interesting place to put all these to just wham bam and it's done, is basically a renewal of every contractor that um, pre exists in the city for whatever service they're proposing. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Has anybody else raised their hand? Uh, there are two more raised hands. First is Mario Sandoval, followed by Joe Drummond. Okay, Mario, you're up. Hi, good evening, council members, Mayor Silverstein, staff and members of the public. My name is Mario Sandoval. I am a coastal planner with the Mountains Recreation and Conservation Authority, or MRCA. I am sharing a video with you that will serve as my public comment. We have been receiving many public inquiries, including from the press, and we wanted to offer the opportunity for those that do not have social media to view it here. 
Please play the video. Hello, my name is Edgar Del Campo with the MRCA here on Broad Beach Road in Malibu where the MRCA owns and manages access to the very popular and publicly owned Lechuza Beach. As you can see, if you are in the know or a resident, it can be very difficult to find this public access down to this hitting beach. This is why the MRCA have these public coastal access signs installed at three public access ways along this road. With the summer heat ramping up, we just, we wanted to provide this public service, but the city of Malibu chose to cut these signs down and confiscate them. We just retrieved them from the city and wanted to let you and all Californians know that this beach is here and it is for your enjoyment. Thank you. Thank you, that concludes my comment. Thank you, Mario. Next is Joe Drummond. Good evening, Honorable Silverstein, Mayor Silverstein and City Council. I do wanna thank Kristen Riego and her team also. They are just a fabulous department and the Malibu Sea Wolves loves them and we love them. So thank you for all your service. And to um, just to the last commenter from MRCA, I, I'm glad you're, you're telling people where the coastal access is. I just wish you would take care of your own properties like the one at Big Rock and PCH, which has not been cleared in years. And, and um, our neighborhood have to, had to actually clear your property for brush clearance and for the view. Um, the view corridor that's supposed to be there, that you're supposed to be taken care of. Um, about, I just wanted to reiterate what Craig Hill was saying. I do agree that the planning commissioners should get a small stipend. I think 3,000 a year for each one is fine. I'm sure there are reasons possibly that some of them do not need it or want it because maybe they are getting perks in other ways, I don't know. And um, I also want to agree with Ryan. We'll come here every two weeks and talk about that um, mar of an antenna pole at the Santa Monica College that is height violating, color violating, and it really, the permit needs to be revoked and it needs to be removed. And um, it was never supposed to be that big or that, and to have all that, those communications things put on it. It wasn't supposed to be that at all. It was supposed to be much less visible than the old one, which it's not at all. Um, and then the other, the only other thing I have to mention is, again, with small projects, variances in landslide areas, it, I think their reinterpretation of the code needs to be applied for small projects for anything under 10% or more or, or, la or less, sorry that should be, should not have to have a variance in the landslide area. There's never been variances for any small projects in Big Rock, as far as I know, for, so I don't know why they're suddenly doing it all of a sudden. So um, that's it for now, but I hope something can be done about all those issues. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Any other hands raised? Those are all the raised hands. Okay, that closes public comment on 2A. That takes us to commission and committee report updates, if there are any. Do we have any? You don't have any commissioner committee updates. Okay, right. moving right along then, city manager update. Thank you, Mayor Silverstein. Uh, I also would like to thank Kristen Riesgo and the uh, staff of the Community Services Department. Thank you, wonderful presentation, and thank you for everything that you're doing. Uh, a couple of updates I wanted to give on uh, for environmental services. Um, one, that uh, city's offering an organic waste recycling virtual training on Wednesday, no, uh, July 19th at 7 p.m., funded by CalCycle. Uh, this organics waste recycling program is an important way that Malibu can fulfill its commitment as a community to be part of the efforts to address climate change and protect the environment. Uh, attendees uh, will receive a free dishwasher safe, 1.9 gallon kitchen scraps caddy uh, to help separate your food waste. So again, that's coming up on Wednesday, uh, August 19th at 7 p.m. Uh, also, uh, the city will be celebrating uh, Plastic Free July this month. 
Uh, this global movement, which was started by Plastic Free Foundation in 2011, aims to create a world that is free of plastic weight, waste. The city has kicked off this, uh, um, this movement by celebrating International Plastic Bag Free Day uh, on July 3rd. Uh, please follow our social media campaign to learn more tips, tricks, uh, and about city policies that encourage a plastic-free lifestyle uh, by following the link on our website. You can find that in the city manager update. I also wanted to report on our fire rebuilds. Uh, to date, we've now issued 261 permits for single-family dwellings. Uh, 131 single-family dwellings have been complete. Uh, and uh, to the states, we have the 18 uh, uh, for multi-family buildings, we have 18 uh, units, uh, permits issued, and 12 units have been completed. Uh, I think for those who uh, managed to catch, we had a little earthquake off the coast on July 2nd. It was uh, an up 3.8 magnitude. Uh, Public Works staff did do an assessment uh, on the morning, and there was no damage. We did not observe any, any issues as a result of that. So happy to report that. I um, also wanted to report that um, our city staff met recently with the, um, the Bay Foundation to learn more about the Malibu Beach restoration work that they're going to be doing. Uh, they're not going to be doing any new work, but rather they're continuing the work that they initiated in 2019. They're going to be replacing the posts and ropes at Westward Beach and the area north of Zuma Creek uh, that fell over in the 2023 uh, winter storms. Uh, the new design will ensure that only portions of the posts and ropes are affected in the event of future storms. And then uh, I think there's uh, continuing good news on AB 1500, which was the, uh, the bill that was introduced by Assemblymember Irwin uh, to extend the property tax exemption for homes that were damaged or destroyed in the Woolsey fire uh, that moved out of the Senate Governance and Finance Committee with an 8-0 vote and is now being sent over to the Senate Appropriations Committee. Uh, so far, the bill has not encountered any opposition. Uh, assuming it gets through that committee, um, uh, then it will probably likely go to the full legislature for vote. Um, the legislature will be taking a break uh, after next week, and they'll be dark for about a month. So it will probably be uh, not much news for a little while, probably until they come back in the session. Also wanted to report that the city was recently recognized as a leader in composting by the State Recycling Association. California Resource Recovery Association honored Malibu with the Dave Hardy Leadership Award and Organics, uh, the Dave Hardy Leadership and Organics Award last month in recognition of the city's organics recycling program, outreach events, and marketing. The city has offered monthly virtual organic waste recycling trainings, as you heard me mention earlier, uh, in-person training for seniors, advertising, and social media messaging around its organics recycling program. Staff also meet recently with California State Parks regarding their proposal to remove the Wrench Dam and transport about 800,000 cubic yards of sediment. Uh, that's proposed to go at this point to potentially to the Calabasas landfill and to the Malibu Lagoon. State Parks has received $12 million in funding uh, from the state legislature, that's and the project is only in the design phase at this point. Uh, the goal of the project is to have design complete and permits in place by 2026. Uh, project started with a public meeting here at City Hall on June 13th. State Parks will be setting up stakeholder group uh, meetings with other agencies, including the city, to make sure that all interested parties are involved. Uh, and I'll make sure that I, we keep the council and community involved on that and uh, in, informed as it moves forward. Uh, again, the project is in a very early stage of development, um, so we'll see uh, how that continues to move forward. We're anticipating uh, getting a report soon from Baker Tilly on the Development Services Review. We'd like to see if there is interest in uh, taking that to the ad hoc committee before bringing that back to the full council. Uh, regardless, uh, we're looking to wrap up the work on that and bring that report to council soon after the summer break. Pleased to announce uh, the selection and appointment of Alexis Brown as the city's new deputy city manager. Uh, Alexis will be joining the city team at the end of this month, and I look forward to uh, welcoming her, and I look forward to everybody getting to know her. Uh, she, Alexis most recently served as the assistant city manager for the city of Imperial, where she was responsible for overseeing the work of eight departments, including police and public works, among other responsibilities. Uh, she is a proven collaborator and solid communicator with a strong track record as a problem solver. Uh, and she's such a dedicated employee that she's already sending me text messages. And I think I've already gotten three or four messages from her during the meeting. So she's watching as we speak. So welcome, Alexis. And we look forward to uh, officially introducing you at the August 14th meeting. 
Um, there is no a meeting for July 27th. The council is taking its summer recess. So it's actually gonna be five weeks before we come back to our next regular meeting since we have five Mondays in July. So again, the next regular meeting will be August 14th. I'd like to, uh, lastly, I'd like to read a statement that the city issued today in response to the um, video that was posted by our friends at the Mountains Recreation and Conservation Authority. Uh, on June 26, the city of Malibu removed beach access signs that were installed at three locations along Broad Beach Road, a city-owned street near La Chusa Beach. These signs require a city permit to be issued to MRCA. The city continually supports public access to beaches in Malibu, which is, as you know, protected under state law for the entire coast of California. Um, but as, as uh, just make sure that the public understands that um, these signs require a city encroachment permit. Um, MRCA did not obtain uh, permits from the city. Uh, and additionally, these uh, signposts that were installed are, are not safe. Uh, they are not designed for breakaway safety if they were to be struck by a, uh, by a vehicle. Uh, they were installed with six inch steel posts. That's not acceptable for a road sign. Uh, and so the city did remove those signs because they were not permitted and not conform to our safety standards. Uh, we're certainly more than willing to work with MRCA. Uh, they just need to work with us to get a permit and uh, we're happy to work with them on getting those signs back uh, at appropriate locations and in an appropriate and safe manner. And I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, from council. And if not, I'll turn it over to uh, Sergeant Soderlin for a report from the Sheriff's Department. Chris, you're up. Give me 30 seconds here. Mayor, may I ask a manager a question in the meantime? Go ahead. Uh, with regards to MRCA, uh, did they reach out? I know in a, a previous meeting we encouraged them to reach out to you <laughs> and our other staff members in advance of any of the things that they needed to do on their properties or enhancing their properties. Was there any outreach from MRCA to you or staff in advance of those sign placements? Uh, not that I believe, and I'm looking to my public works director who is confirming me with that, that no, there was no advance warning. When, we, when the signs came up, um, we did contact them and uh, let them know that they needed permits uh, and asked if they could remove them. Um, and they said they would remove the signs. They ultimately did not. And at that point, that's when the city removed them and we contacted them and made arrangements for them to pick up the signs. Thank you. Um, I'd run once again, um, hopefully from MRCA still listening here, that please work with our staff. We definitely encourage public access and we want to be good partners in this. Um, just got to give us a chance. Thank you. Thank you <clears throat> to the city manager, a quick question as well. Uh, are there other locations in the city where these uh, same sign problems exist and need to be addressed? Not that I'm aware of off the top of my head. I, I believe there's other signs in location that are MRCA signs that have been permitted by the city and, and are, are up and functioning quite well. Ready when you are. You're up. City Council, Mr. Mayor, thanks for having me this evening. Um, I have the uh, statistics from June, um, part one crimes, year to date, we're at 212, uh, the same time the year before. You can save that for later. <laughs> that, that, that's for the end of this. <laughs> uh, so 212 um, year to date. Uh, last year at this time, there's 242 part one crimes. So that's 30 less, which is 12.4% decrease uh, in part one crimes, which are the most serious crimes. Um, some noteworthy incidents here, um, some I've talked about before, but they're included in here. Um, there were two incidents of felony domestic violence uh, reported this month on Pacific Coast Highway. In one incident, a Studio City resident was arrested for assaulting his girlfriend. Uh, that was the one in front of Joffrey's. Uh, in another incident, a Los Angeles resident was arrested for also assaulting his girlfriend. Uh, <clears throat> a Los Angeles transient 
was arrested for residential burglary on Broad Beach Road. Uh, I spoke about that one with the helicopter. Um, there were eight vehicle burglaries in one incident. Uh, the vehicle windows were shattered to gain entry. Surveillance foot, uh, video footage showed one suspect wearing black clothing, a mask, and blue latex gloves. The suspect was driving a dark vehicle and a white SUV was following the suspect, act, acting as a lookout. Uh, another incident, a resident of Los Angeles was arrested for possession of a stolen vehicle on Malibu Canyon Road. The suspect was additionally charged with violation of probation. The vehicle was stolen from the jurisdiction of the Los Angeles Police Department's Olympic Division. And the suspect's associate, who was a transient inside the vehicle, was charged for identity theft and for possession of debit and credit cards that were issued to different people and for a felony warrant for reckless evading. Uh, in another incident, three suspects, residents of Hacienda Heights, La Puente, and La Puente, uh, were arrested for possession of a stolen vehicle. The vehicle was stolen from the jurisdiction of the Huntington Beach Police Department. During the investigation, several, several burglary tools and documents containing information that could be used for identity theft were found inside the vehicle. And the last one um, for the noteworthy incidents was made by the 108 X-ray car, which is the special assignment deputies that work overnight. Uh, in this one, a Los Angeles res resident was arrested for possession of a stol stolen vehicle on Pacific Coast Highway near Topanga Canyon at the city limits. Uh, the su suspect had narcotics paraphernalia on him, and he was transported to the jail, and the vehicle was uh, returned to the victim, which was the registered owner. I have some highlights from the uh, special assignment deputies, including that arrest. Um, throughout the past two weeks, they conducted foot patrols of transient encampments, um, including Legacy Park and the library area next door. Uh, they assisted uh, the regular patrol units uh, in their calls and as well as on traffic stops. Uh, during the time, they, they also arrested a suspect for an outstanding felony warrant for vandalism. They arrested a, a parolee who violated the terms of his parole and was returned to custody. And they made uh, multiple arrests for um, drivers driving with suspended licenses. Uh, during the time, they also um, arrested a um, person who uh, willfully failed to register their vehicle in California. Uh, I'm referring to the white Sprinter van at Las Tunas Beach. Uh, so he was arrested for willfully avoiding California registration fees and his vehicle was towed um, where it had been sitting for a year plus without moving. Um, and finally, this past Saturday, the beach team um, the parking control officers, they noticed a vehicle which was parked in a no parking zone. And so they called for a tow truck to have that vehicle towed. Uh, inside the vehicle was a, looked like a hoarder's vehicle. It was covered with trash and debris inside. And so they waited about 30 minutes for the tow truck to come. Uh, in that time, it was about 70 degrees outside. The windows were rolled up and it was bright sunshine. The tow truck came, took it to the tow yard at Malibu High School, and while they were doing the paperwork for the tow, they heard whimpering and crying come from, coming from the vehicle. And when they went and looked in the vehicle, there was a little dog in there trying to get out and get help, and there was no water or food inside the, the vehicle. So they were able to break into the vehicle and get the dog out and took it to the shelter. So fast forward about an hour later, a person flags the deputies down who are riding the, the quads on Zoom, on the beach there, saying, my car's been stolen and my dog was inside. Well, he was uh, under the influence of a controlled substance at the time, and the deputies went to detain him, and he was uncooperative and physically res resisted the deputies. And they were able to arrest him, and he was arrested for animal cruelty, and here is the dog that we rescued. So, a couple highlights. You did good. Is he awaiting, awaiting adoption or uh, is he? It's on hold until the criminal stuff plays out, but.
usually when they're arrested for animal cruelty, they don't get to have an animal Hope back. So. so, yeah. Well, that's a shame to hear. Um, Ask a question. Yes. Every part one crime that you described was committed by someone who was not a Malibu resident. Uh, is that correct? Correct. Um, what percentage, if any, of the part one crimes in the year are committed by Malibu residents? Slim to none. So I expect it. Yep. Sergeant, good work. And um, I, I, I saw the picture there and I thought, is this a new K-8? Or K <laughs> that's a, it's all tongue. <laughs> it's a cute dog. Yeah. Uh, can you give us a little update about uh, how things went over this last uh, holiday week, basically, with the beach team? And um, you mentioned something about some of the arrests and so forth. I'm wondering time of day, time of week, if there's any pattern to that uh, as well. Um, so, yes, we had the long holiday weekend. There was really no major issues. Uh, we had one um, uh, hit and run at Westward Beach and PCH. It was a motorcyclist that was hit by a truck and the truck took off. Um, the collision caused the front license plate to come off. So we were able to identify the truck and the driver who was from Oxnard. So we went to Oxnard and impounded the truck and arrested the driver. Um, other than that, there was really no major issues over the, the holiday weekend. And as far as the, the timing of the crime, most are, are committed in the uh, late evening to overnight hours. Very good. Also, uh, there was, uh, I think, an issue at Nobu over the week uh, about traffic access and uh, PCH being congested. Any comments on that? Um, we got in contact with Nobu. They had a, uh, a party there. Um, approximately like 700 people. They did not inform us. We uh, have a meeting scheduled with them next week to uh, reiterate the communication that needs to happen between them and us. And hopefully this won't happen again. Uh, if you're gonna take cat, now Captain C2, I believe when she was Lieutenant C2, she had a uh, very profound meeting with him about something similar, so. It's gonna happen again next week. <laughs> You know, hearing that story about the, the person with the dog in the car, it's just, I, I'm one of the more um, strong advocates for not having people living unhoused on public property. But, you know, arrest is not the solution for that. That person's obviously met, has mental problems, and it's a shame that arrest has to be the issue, has to be the solution. That we need to do something better than that. I don't mean you, but we, in general, society. Anybody else have any comments or questions? Well, Chris, we want to thank you again for all you did over Fourth of July week, which uh, had a lot of activity and fortunately not a whole lot of bad outcomes. And I would uh, I just want to take another moment to remind uh, the mayor that the uh, gentleman with the dog was also on a controlled substance, which is not a victimless crime in this case. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. I have, I'm sorry. Oh. Yes. Um, I saw on social media there was an incident that the VOPs identified um, from Westward Beach Road on Point Doom with a fire. Um, no? Okay. I hadn't heard about that. Um, yeah, there were apparently some people uh, went on top uh, on one of the prominent points on Point Doom and started a large fire and so the VOP okay. so I want to make sure the VOPs got identified saying thank you for that mm -hmm. there were a number of fireworks illegal fireworks I assume um, do you have any comment on so yeah we we, got, we get a lot of uh, firework calls um, this the time of year um, usually the, the units are tied up with other uh, calls that are happening at the same time. And it's tough to, to identify who lights them off, but um, we are looking into doing a like firework suppression uh, detail next year to that they'll just target people who light fireworks. And so that th there can be some hefty fines if they're caught with that because they're incendiary devices. I encourage that, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank Steve, you. Did you have a comment? Yeah, I'll just um, I'll echo what everybody else says. You're doing a heck of a job out there, so, so thank you very, very much. You're welcome. Okay. 
A question for the city <clears throat> manager or planning director. Um, the Nobu party, did they need a, spe a permit for that? Well, the event was not permitted, so I don't know whether or not they were able to get a permit for it or not. I, I don't I don't know, Richard. Perhaps you could add to that. No, Mike, but it was it was something that should have been <clears throat> should have required a permit. Is that correct or no? Well, it, it was not authorized, so th th it, that was not activity that they would normally be able to do. Whether or not they could do it with a permit or not, I I, I don't know exactly what the extent of the activity was. Okay. You've answered my question. In other words, okay. it, it's not something that they were that they had authority to do without a permit. They may or may not have had a th the ability to get a permit. Correct. Okay. So are we are we taking any enforcement action? Yes, we're still working on that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I have a secondary question to that. Isn't that a that property cannot possibly be zoned for seven hundred people uh, to have an event there? I'm talking about the parking requirements <clears throat> and everything else that goes with it. I mean, to me, that's a that's a violation of everything that they have in a permit, not just a temporary use permit. I, I'm just stunned that it happened. Steve? I'm, I'm going to, and look, I've been hearing about Nobu for a very, very long time, all right? Uh, back when I was in the Planning Commission, we were supposed to get some solutions for Nobu. <clears throat> it never showed up. <clears throat> I know Rob has done some work to change some of the area and that got put on hold because of the synchronization project that's going on. But we got to do something to stop Nobu from just doing whatever the hell they want whenever they want to do it. They just don't care. And I'm going to make a recommendation, <clears throat> excuse me, that we take uh, and, and send this back to the Public Safety Commission. I mean, let them take a look at what we can possibly do, whether, whether they can come up with a solution for all the overall traffic problems we got with Nobu, or maybe at the very least they can come up with some plans to say before Nobu runs another one of these parties, here are the steps they got to go through to make sure that the city knows what's going on, that the sheriff knows what's going on, that we at least got that thing under control because they this set, they did the same thing last year, right? Same party last year. That this is unless we do something to put some squeeze on them, they're going to continue to do whatever the heck they want, and we're going to continue to have this problem. So I just, you know, I, I don't know how to get it back to the Public Safety Commission, but I think they, I know Chris Frost has talked to Captain C2. She, he was working with her the last time she was dealing with Nobu. They've got some insight in terms of what's going on. I think they can help her come up with a solution. So I don't know if I can get any second to do that or how I get that on the, their agenda, but boy, I should like to have that happen. I'd be happy to second that, but I think we also need to look at our fine schedule too for, you know, if this is repeatedly happening every single year, we need to have some way of making it a more punitive uh, I, I talked to Chris about that. That's what I'm hoping they can do with the Public Safety Commission, come up with some suggestions. Well, I think I'm looking to planning and the city managers to, you know, maybe, I don't know if it has to go to A&E for fines. I don't know. It's, it's kind of a complicated all right, well, look, we, do, we, we, don't, we don't know what the facts are with respect to this particular incident, and I, the city I, is looking at it, we've been told. I can the, give you And the sheriff's some looking context. at it as well. If you'd like to, so, go ahead. So, sure. um, specifically, um, besides the 700 people there, they uh, had private transportation, the majority of them. So, there were party buses, limousines, um, private, you know, coaches, and what they did was, because there wasn't any parking for them, they basically took over the center median of PCH and left their vehicles there. And, um, you know, there's dozens and dozens of vehicles. So one deputy showing up can't really right. do much in that instance. So that, that's the context of what happened. I had people call me up asking me to bring them sandwiches because the traffic was over. Yeah. Up, so. <laughs> All right, I think we've um, addressed this one as much as we can on an unagendized item, so right. thank you. Um, can I get some consensus to send it back to public safety? I just want to say, we can't send a code enforcement action to the Public Safety Commission. Um, it's something that needs to be addressed by staff. Public safety also can't look at a particular project. It's not appropriate for them to be analyzing a project because there could be a CUP application coming forward that would then come to the Planning Commission and the City Council. Um, if you want them to look at things, they can only look at sort of the public road there in front of Nobu and solutions about that, but they can't be um, taking a, a, a code enforcement Action. Well, then somehow, Steve, you got to make sure the public or planning department, whoever's got responsibility, actually comes up with something. It's been years now, and we've seen nothing. 
Uh, I mean, that's a major violation of their no? CUP. I mean, that's something whatever. that can be looked I mean, at. We just got to get some so. action taken because this is, again, this is, they're doing whatever they want to do uh, in, with immunity, and that, that, that's wrong. So, okay, I'll let it go. All right. So I think that concludes the city manager report, and that takes us to um, city council <clears throat> member reports. Who would like to go first? Paul? Sure. Uh, it was relatively uneventful for me in the last few weeks, with the exception of spending four nights on arson watch patrol, July 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. And fortunately for three of those nights, we had enough fog that it ended fairly early for me. But on uh, 4th of July, I was out there and thought that everything was quiet until about 9 o'clock when suddenly Broad Beach and uh, Zuma Beach both erupted with lots of fireworks. And of course, uh, although we were able to call for backup on radios, the, uh, it, the time it takes for a response on 4th of July is ridiculous. So moving right along. But other than that, we were lucky that the weather was damp enough that nothing caught a fire, and I'm grateful for that. All right, thank you, Paul. Doug, Marianne, who would like to go next? Uh, I, too, had a, a pretty uneventful time, other than um, being able to watch another Point Doom uh, 4th of July parade. Um, it's one parade that I think there are more participants than there are uh, <laughs> people watching it, but so I always take pride in being able to watch it. Um, I want to make sure that I thank community members uh, Pamela connolly Ulick and Paul Major for spearheading the organization on that. Uh, CERT, the VOPs, the Sheriff Department, the Fire Department um, all participated and helped into it to make a, a great event, so thank you very much. And I also want to make sure we thank city staff. They were instrumental in making sure that um, all the proper um, regulations were <clears throat> followed and um, observed. Uh, so I also, uh, as I mentioned, I want to thank the VOPs for their vigilance. Wanted to thank Arson Watch for being out there, um, CERT and everyone else uh, that makes sure our community is taken care of. The volunteers that we have here um, across the board are absolutely wonderful, and we're so lucky to live in such a caring community. I want to say welcome to Alexis. We look forward to meeting you and um, can't wait for you to join our team here. Um, let's see. Uh, with regards to the antenna poll, has an application been submitted to the city and is it under review? As required by the Coastal Development Permit that approved the development on the county property, they did apply for the required conditional use permits. They've also, as part of their application, have worked with us to address the color issue and the lighting issue. Uh, they are not addressing our concerns about the height and so that is something that we'll be setting up a follow-up meeting on. Um, and ideally, it would be a meeting with the county decision makers. Uh, the applicant for the county has uh, informed us that, it, I, if I understand correctly, it's county council's opinion that they have approval for that height because that height was shown on the project plans that went before the planning commission and also were part of the public presentation given by uh, the staff planner when they showed um, the sections as well as 3D renderings of the uh, proposed development. But basically the application has been submitted. It is going through the process. Planning department is working on um, completing that application to be presented to the planning commission at a future date. Yes. So the community should just stand by and uh, we will be seeing it at some time in the future. Right, it needs a public hearing. Thank you very much. Um, that's all I've got. Thank you. I'll be quick. Uh, this uh, time between our last council meeting and this one, 
it's been a very quiet time for government work uh, between the holidays and people's days off and uh, vacations that seem to happen with the, uh, that week. Uh, pretty quiet. But I will say and echo what Mary Ann said about uh, the Fourth of July parade. You look at what makes a, a community, and quite often those Fourth of July parades are just the heart of the city coming out. And uh, thanks to everybody that made it happen, uh, especially the volunteers. And, you know, we forget about arson watch and the VOPs and the CERT people when nothing's going wrong. But they were all on duty this last week, along with the sheriff and, and uh, the other volunteers who are out there. And thanks very much to all of them. That's all I have. Thanks, Doug. Steve? Okay. Uh, I'll be relatively quick. Uh, I was thankful that on, at least on the around the middle of the city, uh, there were not that many fireworks that went off late at night. However, uh, over Point Doom, I understand they were going out there all night long, or some significant portion of the night. And it was just interesting that there was a fire, you know, there's a fire station right in the end of Zuma, and the fireworks were going on, it looked like fairly close to there, and the fire department never took a truck, a truck, or a truck out to try and take a look at what the heck was going on, because, you know, these things can start fires, right? So you would think that somebody from the fire department may have stopped by, because I think the sheriff was right, getting a sheriff up there is, is difficult, but I got a fire station and a fire truck, and somebody could have at least gone out and, and try to slow, stop some of this stuff. Now, it's interesting. I read a story. I, I think it was someplace in the valley, or I guess what the neighbors did. They got together prior to the 4th of July, and they identified what they thought were the, their neighbors who had either gone out and purchased fireworks, who had traditionally been uh, known to set them off. And I guess what the sheriff did is visit those people prior to the 4th of July, gave them a warning that says, don't do that. And as a result of that, there were very few uh, concerns with fireworks in that community. So there, there may be some things we can do. It's just we got to be a little creative, something to think about. We talked about Nobu. Man, I'll tell you, that's, again, it's been the same years. Uh, B, B, the VOPs. I just want to congratulate those guys. Are you right, Marianne? There was a thing where they noticed the fire up in Point Doom and had it put out. There was another instant, in, instance where they apparently the guy was speeding or they stopped a car someplace up near Heathercliff. And when they got into, when they pulled the car over, the guy had guns, he had fetched shells in the car. I mean, it was, it was a mess. So the VOP, the people that I talked to said some of those VOPs were out there almost 24 hours straight over the 4th of July working. Uh, and, you know, if you know these people, if you see them, congratulate them, because they are doing one hell of a job keeping Malibu safe. Uh, so thank you know thank them all very very much. Uh, I missed the Cal strategy meeting this morning, uh, and did you get to have a chance to talk about that? I'm four two three. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Oh, you are okay. I just that, I'm getting a, I'm getting a bunch of calls on that. So I just want to let, let the community know that we are looking at that. Uh, and we may have some solutions. Other than that, Mayor, back to you. Okay, thank you, Steve. So um, relatively uneventful for me as well. The last two weeks, um, I did have a meeting, a Zoom meeting with um, certain individuals who are trying to raise some funds for the public schools. With um, meeting was with um, representatives of, of sub Supervisor Horvath's staff, and um, it, was just, it was just more of an informational session than anything else. Um, CalStrat, so this morning we did um, meet and we spoke about um, SB 423. This, for people who aren't following, it's a bill that will um, open, ease the ability to build affordable uh, multifamily housing where you otherwise wouldn't be able to or, or with, with lesser restrictions and lesser permit requirements. Um, that's probably a poor explanation of it, but that, that's a, an overview from 10,000 feet. Um, in the past, these kinds of things had exempted the coastal cities. This particular bill does not have a coastal zone exemption, um, and the Coastal Commission is opposed to it. Um, somebody said earlier, it might have been Steve, um, or it might have been someone else, that um, it's understood that it's likely going to pass the uh, assembly and likely be signed by the governor. That's Those are not necessarily the case. Um, there is the, the, the assembly is listening. The governor may veto this, especially since the coastal commission is opposed to it. But in any event, um, we 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 we're not formally because we don't have the ability to do it without it being an agendized item. But we're we're working with our uh, lobbyists um, 
to help the Coastal Commission's objection. We agree, we agree with them. Um, we're looking into whether there couldn't be an additional exemption for very high fire hazard severity zones on the coast, um, which may be a fair compromise. And um, we do have people that are looking into that, working on it, speaking to the people that need to be spoken to. So we're not ignoring it. Um, other than that, um, I have a question, well, not a question, but a comment on the fireworks. Um, some places are having drone, well, more and more they're having drone shows these days, which are a very good uh, environmentally safe replacement for fireworks. And um, I just like to encourage us to think about maybe having a city um, show next year or in, and in the future. It could be a nice thing for our residents. It's safe. And um, I think everybody would appreciate it. So with that, let's move on to uh, the consent calendar. Remote participants, again, please raise your hand in Zoom if you'd like to speak on an item on the consent calendar. I have no speaker slips unless one is, nope, no, have no, no speaker slips. So um, have any members of the public wish to pull an item on the consent calendar? There are two raised hands, one from Joe Drummond and then followed by Ryan. Okay, let's ask them just if they want to pull something, not get their comments yet. Please state the item number you would like to pull. Uh, 3A. 3A, okay. Ryan? Uh, I think it's 3B8, which I think is for traffic, and 3B12, which was uh, a bid. Okay. Does anybody on council wish to pull something other than 3A1, 3B8, or 3B12? I just need to abstain from 3B3. I need to abstain from 3B3 as well. Okay. Um, I ha I I'd like to pull 3B13. Anything else being pulled? No, right. I'll make a motion to approve the consent calendar minus 3A, 3B8, 3B12, and 3B13. And with Doug and Marianne abstaining from 3B3. Okay, is there a second? I'll, uh, I'll second. We have a roll call, please. Councilmember Rickens? Yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Mayor Pro Tamiri? Yes. Mayor Silverstein? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, somebody, um, Joe Drummond pulled 3A1, which is the second reading of the LCP amendment proposal for the um, Sea View Hotel. Joe, the floor is yours. Oh yeah, I just wanted to just make mention and just, just make caution on it. future hotel projects and this hotel project that, um, you know, you have to really think about what it's replacing. Like I sent an email later this afternoon about how it's replacing a a resident serving wellness retreat center that has members that are member res residents and that we're actually, we should be serving our residents over the developers, tourists, and we'll have more of these kind of events like at Nobu at all these hotels that they keep coming up. It'll be ended up being like Redondo Beach here. Like it'll be bars on the pier and nightclubs. And it's just like, we just have to be cautious of what we're approving. And I'm, I'm hoping that this will be the last. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Um, Fred, you submitted a slip. Do you have something to say? Okay. Um, I have a couple questions I'd like to ask before we vote on this one. Um, Fred or um, Norm, when will the MRCA uh, money be funded? It is based on when the uh, project receives permits. So the $800,000 hasn't yet been funded to the MRCA? Oh, I'm sorry. You're talking about the, the, the funds that are in escrow? Yes. The funds that are in escrow uh, can be released to the MRCA at the discretion of the executive director um, after the LCPA is finalized. Whether or not the project ever goes forward? That is correct. Okay. What about the additional funding that was agreed to as part of this? That's the question I was answering the first first time. It's tied to actual uh, building permits. Okay. Wh when will the check valve be funded? The check valve will be part. It's a condition of approval of the project, so it'll be. Uh, it'll have to be uh, completed 
uh, as an offsite improvement as uh, before they can get a certificate of occupancy for the hotel. When will the surfing charity be funded? The surfing charity, I don't know that, um, that we, have we established exactly when the surfing charity will be funded or is that? Uh, no. Yeah, I don't think that, I don't think we actually said it. That, that one was not specified. Is that also contingent on permits and going forward? I'm sorry? Is it contingent on permits and going forward, or is it a commitment irregardless? It'll be funded before the permits are yeah. funded, before yeah. the permits are issued. Yeah. That, if, the, if the project were not to move forward, would it be funded? It, it will not move forward unless it's funded. That's okay. correct. Okay. In terms of construction. No, no, no. It, it, will the charity be funded if the project were not to go forward, as the MRCA is? No. No. So I thought. When will the city be funded? It's 800000 only if the project's going forward? The city, we have a development agreement with the city that lays out when that funding is, um, is paid. So it's at the time that the, um, it is tied to the construction of the project. Okay, thank you. So it's just, you know, I, I've opposed this before. I'm going to oppose it again tonight. I'm sure I'll be the only one, but I mean, you know, the MRCA got its money right away. They shouldn't have gotten any money at all, but they got it. It's theirs now. All the other benefits that are going to the city directly and indirectly um, are dependent upon this project going forward, if it goes forward at all. Um, does anybody else have any comments or questions? So let's call the roll on this. Oh, well, sorry. Somebody want to make a motion? I'll make a motion that we approve the second reading and adoption of ordinance number 508. I'll second. Any other comments? Roll call, please. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Uri? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Mayor Silverstein? No. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, takes us to 3B8. I believe that was called, that was um, pulled by Ryan. Ryan, would you like a report of any sort or do you have comments you'd just like to make? I'll make my, I can make my comment now. Go ahead. Uh, the I'd like to know if uh, the other uh, bidders and, and the names of the other bidders of all these contracts, you know, because that's the only way the public or maybe even the council will know if or which bidders didn't bid. Or maybe they could find out why a bidder didn't bid. Um, this city had traditionally over many years time, the services from other professional firms and Recently, there was um, a, a, what I would say uh, from all of my experience of 25 years doing traffic issues in Malibu, a very skewed analysis report for a survey of speed traffic on Morning View Drive between Via Cabrillo in front of the school down to Pacific Coast Highway. And I did a little research in looking up the data for that, and it was a very small sampling in the middle of the day when there was very little traffic and at a time that I think the road was all torn up from truck traffic of removing tons and tons of mud from the neighborhood. And it said that, the, that like nobody, no traffic went over 20 miles an hour in any of the tested samples on that section of road. And which is, which conflicted with all the prior years average data and, and but anyway, the recommendation uh, was based on a very odd anomaly. And it got me thinking about who did this study? And, and you know, it was Kinley Horn. And I thought, well, we need a traffic engineering company that isn't gonna tell us stupid stuff like that, or that traffic hasn't diminished in 25 years, or that, you know, and we had great service with Wildan Engineering's traffic engineers, which Agura Hills has used and others. And I'd like to know specifically if Wildan Engineering bid on this and or why not? Uh, because I think we're getting back into this uh, scenario of getting too cushy with certain contractors. And you'll notice that, you know, the next contract, 3B9, for other engineering services is also to the same company, uh, which is a renewal. And so, um, we didn't seem to have these traffic problems when we had um, Will Dan Engineering. I, I just want to put it out there. We got problems in front of Nobu. We got problems with uh, projects, you know, like across from the pier, thinking that traffic isn't isn't a problem. And then, you know, 
left turns, right turns, right next to a traffic signal are probably going to be fine. And we need a better analysis than what we've been getting. So I just wanted to put that out there. And I'd be interested to know, and I know you don't always have to take the lowest bidder for good cause, but you can do that. Um, so thank you. All right, thank you, Ryan. Um, does anybody on council have any comments? I should say that that closes public um, comment on that item. Yes. Correct. We don't have any other raised hands or speaker slips. Okay. Thank you. Paul, do you have something to say? I'd like to make a motion that we pass item three B eight. I'll second it with a comment. Um, you know, there's a lot of false information out there about what that traffic study years ago said. It did not say that traffic has not increased. It just said that there's not an increase of the amount of cars on the road at any particular time, but the amount of hours that those cars are on the road has extended. So I would just like people to watch the video and read the report for the accuracy of that information. Steve? And I don't mean to argue, but if you, you're talking about the, the traffic study for, yeah. okay. If you watch the video, you'll notice that one of the planning commissioners asked the traffic engineer, does this mean traffic hasn't increased in 25 years? And the traffic engineer's answer was yes. So it seemed fairly definitive to me. I would encourage everyone to watch the video themselves and read the report themselves for the accurate information. Don't take it just as gospel from people speaking. Okay, so... Um Ryan asked a number of questions. Um, I, it's not obligatory on the part of staff or um, city manager to answer any of them, but were any questions asked that you felt ought to be answered? Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I just wanted to note that this was not a, a, a bidding situation. Um, from what I understand, um, this agreement was entered into in uh, August of 2020, and I'm, I'm not sure I'd have to ask Mr. Debeau at that point if we did an RFP. Uh, but this was not a process where we went out and did uh, a new RFP. Um, this is an extension for one year. Uh, I think our typical practice has been, um, you know, we try to go back out to RFP after, you know, three or four years. Uh, it depends on, 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 you know, what's pressing on, on staff's plate um, and on also the availability of, of particular consultants. So I just want to note in this particular case, it's, it's for a one-year extension. And, um, and as per our, our procedures, we, we would be coming back and probably doing an, a, another RFP in another year or so. Okay. Uh, I'll just comment that um, in the three years now, coming on three years that I've been on council, um, I've been impressed with the integrity of the um, staff who make the decisions as to renewing contracts and accepting contracts. And um, I don't believe there's anything nefarious going on to the extent that that is being suggested in any public comment. Um, I don't believe we need to get the um, the play-by-play -play on why these contracts are being proposed to us. Um, they're being proposed to us by honest brokers, and um, to me, that's good enough. We have the contracts to review if we wish, and we get any other information we want if we ask for it. Um, the other thing I'll say is that um, our standard contract does have a termination provision that the, the city has the right to terminate for no cause. Um, on an ongoing basis. So even though these contracts are for a year at a time or longer, they're really month to month contracts. So because of all of those things, I have no problem um, approving these amendments or these contracts in the first instance when they're recommended to us by our staff. Doug? Yeah, I'd like to make a comment on this. <clears throat> it's uh, really easy for someone to say, let's have a review every year. Let's put it out for bid, RFPs, and so forth. But I can tell you from a standard business practice, you generally see every two or three years you'll get a, a proposal a review. And in management practice, it's often referred to as a champion challenger, where you've got the, the current uh, recipient of the agreement now has to be pitched against all the competitors that like to have the business. It's an excellent weeding out process. It's an amazing chance to do a deep dive due diligence as opposed to perfunctory just an RFP. So I think if we're doing it every two or three years, it's a good use of a staff time, and you get a really good benefit out of it if you really have a champion challenger where everybody's trying to get the business. So, uh, and I echo what uh, uh, the mayor said. I don't see any problems with uh, the staff. I think you guys do a good job and uh, very pleased with your performance, and you're the ones that have to live with their results. So you recommend them. I think this is good approval. 
Okay, can we get a roll call, please? <coughs> Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Mayor Pro Tamiri? Yes. Mayor Silverstein? Yes. Motion carries. <laughs> Thank you. That takes us to 3B12. Ryan, you pulled that one as well. Uh, yes. The, this is a different type of contract. Um, 3B12 is a bid contract. So notwithstanding anything that was mentioned about uh, uh, just riding on one-year annual renewals, the City Council has policy for service contracts to be reviewed every two years. And I would like the City Council and City staff to familiarize themselves with that Council policy and plan on complying with it in the future. Uh, this 3 B12 is for guard services, which entails both daily uh, opening closing of three city parks, but also special event um, type security for programs or, or I guess um, requirements of any um, special event permit the city might impose. So we don't really know the significance of, of the level of contracting but the, the parameters of the contract were supposed to be uniform so you get apples and apples types of bids and that the criteria uh, for anything else or by the current contractor having any different standards should not be given extra credit or consideration for a renewal in this instance. So it also said that there were services uh, and interviews conducted but it doesn't say what the prices are for any of these and it has been the city's practice to show prices previously on bids and this omits the bids of majority of the contractors all seven of them and so we don't know if this is the low bid or if it is not the low bid as to what criteria staff imposed that was not published but was given weight in some type of um, evaluation or matrix uh, or disqualification of any other contractor. So if the staff liked a capability that the current contractor has but chose not to put it in the request for proposal and then other contractors did not bid those services, the current contractor should not be given um, the accolades of saying that they drive hybrid vehicles, which in this instance is of no value to the city uh, because hybrids only regenerate power when somebody puts their foot on the brake. Otherwise, they just use gasoline. So uh, that type of consideration could have or should have been and should not be a criteria. So that concerns me that staff had mentioned that in the report to you but omitted the prices of all the other seven bidders so you don't know the ranking or how close, or if a local Malibu bidder, which I think there might've been one, I don't know, but we Thank have- Thank you, a, Ryan, not, your time is up. Are there any other public comments? No, I don't see any other raised hands in Zoom and we don't have any speaker slips. Okay, that brings us back to council. Um, I'll move that we approve this. I'm gonna have a comment, but let's see if I can get a second first. I'll second. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, once again, this is another example. Um, the, the staff report in this instance does say proposals for the RFP were due on May 25. City received eight proposals. Staff reviewed and submitted proposals, interviewed four firms on June 14th. Following the interview, staff contacted references, verified the cost proposals, confirmed the firm's specifications in the submitted proposal. I believe all this to be true. Based on the information staff selected to work with this particular contractor, Again, the contract does also provide for 10 days that can be terminated on 10 days notice. This is a 10 day contract actually. Um, the price seems reasonable and I'm sure that if there were a lower bidder, we'd be hearing from them. We don't need to um, fly spec this because we're being told it's the, it's the appropriate bid. I, I trust that we're being given honest information. Any other comments? Can we have a roll call please? Mayor Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Mayor Pro Tamiri? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, I pulled 3B13. This is a resolution extending the declaration of the COVID-19 local emergency. I just like to understand why we're doing this when others are no longer. Even though I personally still feel about this, but 
Can we get a staff report or something? It was a bit of a groove effort, but I can address it briefly. Um, the council is still making AB 361 findings due to you know the ongoing pandemic. Your state of emergency also allows us to continue certain emergency programs, such as the outdoor dining ordinance, which seemed appropriate through the summer. And it looks like Trevor might have more to address on that point as well. Yeah, the way you do that is this. This is not an AB. What was that number? This is not, not the that, AB right? This is something fine. separate and apart from that? Sure. It's, it's consistent with that, and it, uh, the, the biggest impact would be on the termination of the outdoor dining. That's what I thought. So this is not so that we can continue to have hybrid meetings. This is something above and no. beyond that. exactly. Okay. And so uh, it seems to me it's kind of a end run around the fact that the, high, that the outdoor dining is terminating without us having addressed it specifically. Does that sound about right? I would, I would not call it an end run. This is a publicly <laughs> noticed meeting and everyone's being done out here in public. There are still concerns about it. And um, I, I don't know if Richard wants to comment about the outdoor dining um, and, and the, what the end of that is going to be. But um, if we don't make the findings, then the, the clock immediately starts on unwinding all of that. Uh, is, any, is the state or, any, or the county still in a state of emergency for COVID-19? No, I do not believe they are. Okay, is any other city in this area still in an emergency for COVID-19? I, I couldn't tell you that. I'm not aware of it. No, they're, they're just advising people that they should be careful, I mean, which is the basis for our making the other finding. Um, I, I feel like we really, you know, when we had the state of emergency for the high fire we were told come February or so we need to revoke it, even though I felt we still have a high fire danger area, it, danger situation 365 days a year. Um, but I was told that, well, we need to have a credible factual record for, for continuing a state of emergency declaration. I don't know that we have a credible basis to continue to make state of emergency declarations for COVID-19. It is definitely something people need to be careful about, but. I don't know what basis we have that, that everyone else seems to find lacking to make this find. I just want to say I, I still see people walking around with masks on, still see them in restaurants with masks on, and uh, it, it doesn't hurt me at all to have them do what they need to do. And if it's an emergency for them, I'm, I'm content to leave it that way. Any other comments? Well, with regards to the, t the restaurants, how quickly does that, do they need to cease outdoor operations once the emergency is ended? I believe that we've given them 90 days. I'd have to look for the exact, but the, uh, the, the, the current procedure that we've planned to, uh, to, to implement is that once the state of emergency is removed. Staff is prepared to make contact with all of those restaurants to provide them with information on either removal or uh, how to apply to keep what they have if they choose to go that route. I'll make a motion. I'm sorry, I'll make a motion to, did we do this already? I'm sorry. No. <laughs> I'll make a motion to adopt, approve. <laughs> Oh, did Paul, yes, Paul you make the motion? I don't recall. No, I did not okay, make a so motion. So we have a motion from Marianne. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay. And so, I will say also that uh, when I go to the doctor and they don't ask me to wear a mask, I'll be happy. Quick question for me. You could change doctors. Go ahead. Uh, Richard, you, you just said, and I think what you said was that the restaurants can come back and ask permission to keep stuff that they currently have outdoors. Is that what you're planning? As we mentioned in our previous staff report to the council on this matter, the restaurants could apply, make an application for a conditional use permit. There's like any application, there's no guarantee it'll be approved, but they can make an application for it. Uh, as the structures stand today, some of the outdoor structures, those have not been plan checked. We don't, uh, I'm guessing they don't comply with our vehicle impact protection ordinance. 
and also there's access issues and questions on how those structures were built because none of that was plan checked. Uh, it was not required to. So if the restaurants would like to make an application, uh, that would be the avenue uh, if they look to keep outdoor dining. But that application would have to have a public hearing and they would have to demonstrate that they have the available parking and wastewater flow. Okay, gotcha, thank you. Uh, I'll just make another comment on that that uh, uh, process. I think outdoor dining has proven to be popular, especially in warm climates like we have uh, here in Southern California, especially here in Malibu. Um, hopefully the restaurants have been given a heads up as you've applied and they know what they've got to do because this will come to an end. Um, this is not forever and I'd be surprised if it's going to be continued after this calendar year. So uh, if they've got an interest in trying to keep their outdoor dining going, it's incumbent upon them to get it going, uh, get the permits in. Marion, did you have a further comment? No. Okay. Well, my, my last comment is, is just, again, I, I have been one of the fiercest advocates for COVID-19 precautions over the years that this has been going on. Um, but we're a law lawmaking body here and we have a responsibility, although we have gr broad discretion, to exercise that discretion in a reasonable manner based on facts, not based on feelings. The President of the United States has declared the emergency over, the state has declared the emergency over, the county has declared the emergency over. I don't have facts before me um, upon which I can base a decision that supports my feeling that there's still an emergency. So I can't support this. I think that the only reason this is being proposed is to avoid the need to deal with the restaurant issue. Um, and we need to deal with that. So with that said, unless there's further comments, we'll do a roll call. May I amend, yeah, May sure. I amend my motion? Sure. Bring it back in 60 days so that we can. Well, we're, we're mandated to do that, okay. I believe. Perfect. So, so let's Trevor? take it up in 60 days and. Yeah, we have to take it up or it'll be, right. or it'll expire. But I, would, I would suggest everybody take seriously what we need to be deciding between now and 60 days. You know, maybe somebody will create a record that will make it more palatable to approve this for me, but I don't think that there is one at this point. Can we if if the council wants to direct that it not be brought back and this be the final extension, then staff just won't bring it back if this was to be the final extension for it. That gives a warning I, I, to everybody. I think we should have the council decide that sometime before the next 60 days. Not right now, at a different time? Right. So now the motion is just to extend it. We'll see if it passes. I'm pretty confident it will. Roll call, please. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Mayor Pro Temurine? Yes. Mayor Silverstein? No. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, that takes us to 5A, which I, re I assume will have substantial comments, although I haven't given have any speaker slips yet. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Okay. Not that many. Um, we got a lot of written comments. Okay, so 5A, um, consider adoption of a policy interpreting the use of pesticides as development. Please raise your hand in Zoom if you would like to speak on this item, and you will be called after the public comments, which will follow the staff report. So let's have a staff report, please. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. Sorry, so get squared away here. Uh, this evening, what staff is bringing for your consideration is a formal policy for the implementation of uh, the Land Use Policy 3.18. Uh, just some quick back history here. The, the city proposed a local coastal program amendment to modify the city's land use plan and that was approved by the Coastal Commission. And once that approval was issued by the Coastal Commission, the city has been putting a condition on development permits that as part of the permit, they're required to adhere with land use policy 3.18, which um, has statements in there regarding the use and application of pesticides and insecticides and rodenticides. While that policy has been applied to development projects, projects that have been issued city approvals, 
there was a want to be able to look at how can it, the policy be expanded onto uh, properties in which there is no city issued coastal development permit that contains uh, the condition relating to LUP policy 3.18. The last time this was before the city council was October 10th of 2022. At that hearing, the city council provided direction on two items to staff. One was for staff to prepare an amendment to the city's local implementation plan. So the ordinance section of the city's local coastal program. And the purpose of that ordinance would be to implement the policy uh, that is contained in section 3.18. And the second piece of the direction by the council at that time was for staff to bring back a policy adopting an interpretation of development subject to the requirements of LIP 13.3 that considers the use of pesticides, including insecticides, herbicides, rodenticides, and other similar toxic chemical, sub or toxic chemical substances uh, where the application of such substances um, would have the potential to significantly uh, degrade ESHA or coastal water quality or harm to wildlife and consider that as development. What you have before you this evening is a formal interpretation that if adopted would be put into the city's interpretation manual. Uh, that manual can be found um, as a PDF file on our city's website. Uh, there are numerous interpretations in there. They range from story poles, uh, ridgeline, uh, landscaping. It, it's the general guidance that the planning department uses when having to implement uh, practices or uh, use for uh, questions on how to interpret something in the local coastal program. So if adopted, uh, this particular draft policy would broadly require a CDP for anyone who wants to use uh, these chemicals outside, as since it would be defined as development. And as mentioned in the 2022 council report, the draft policy uh, would not consider the indoor use of these chemicals as development. I'm happy to answer any questions on this matter. Uh, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Does anybody have any questions? Not, not comments, just questions. I have a question. Paul. Richard, uh, how does tenting of houses for termites affected by this? If I recall correctly, when the, I believe that question came up before the last council meeting, and, and I believe that was the genesis of uh, consideration for indoors. Because there is a tent placed over the structure, we're considering it to be indoors? As I, if I recall correctly, I believe that was our uh, okay. determination uh, from the last council meeting. If the council would like, we can make that more clear. Thank you. Okay, public comment, please. Public comment now. So the, uh, we have Kean Shulman, followed by Joel Shulman, followed by Pat Healy. I have a slideshow, please. Sorry. Uh, good evening, Mayor Silverstein, council members, and staff. Thank you again, Malibu, for leading the way in passing the LCP amendment. In July 2013, the city banned the use of anticoagulant poisons on city property. It became obvious that it was not just the anticoagulants that were affecting our ecosystem. In 2016, the city stopped the use of all pesticides and in 2019 adopted an earth-friendly management policy restricting their use. Malibu property has been pesticide-free for the past seven years. Your children and pets can enjoy the parks knowing that they are not contaminated with chemical pesticides. Critter, pesticides threaten environmentally sensitive habitat, wo coastal water quality, and diverse wildlife that calls Malibu home. Malibu's LCP amendment will protect and ensure the preservation of natural resources, include sensitive ESHA, the ocean, marine life, creeks, canyons, plant life, mountains, wildlife, and open spaces. 
Pesticides killed non-target wildlife and are pervasive. Our local Santa Monica Mountain statistics show a 90% exposure rate, rates of poisoning. There are grave threats to mountain lions, to bobcats, coyotes, owls and hawks, and other victims, including raccoons, skunks, foxes, snakes, and insects, especially the endangered monarch butterfly that has declined in 92% in California. The recently deceased mountain lion, P22, had six different rodent poisons in him, including the deadly neurotoxin, brometh bromethylin, which is showing up in boxes everywhere, along with cholecalciferol, vitamin D3, both highly toxic with no antidotes. Our wildlife is in a poisonous stew of pesticides. That our apex predators are being poisoned is a big alarm to what's happening in the wildlife food chain. These poisons still abound here in Malibu, and the boxes attract animals with their poisonous lace bait. Animals don't die in the box, but exit slowly and die then, poison the rest of the wildlife food chain. Pesticides contaminate our soil. They pose grave threats to organisms that are critical to healthy soil, biodiversity, and soil carbon sequestration that fights climate change. In 71% of cases studied, pesticide killed or harmed soil invertebrates. Pesticides and their highly toxic long break breakdown products were found in 90% of our nation's urban streams. They leach into our water supply through our uh, soil erosion and can be particularly uh, toxic to fish and other marine animals. Pesticide pose risks to human health, such as cancers, birth defects, reproductive harm, neurological and developmental toxicity, and disruption of our endocrine system. Thank you for moving this LCP, LCP uh, amendment forward in the most speedy way to benefit us all. Thank you. Thank you. Joel, you're up. Uh, thank you very much for considering this tonight. Uh, just as a background, um, this effort began in, in November of 2014 with Schuyler Peak introducing this LCP amendment. So that's when it started. <clears throat> it was actually inspired by the one month earlier LCP clause in the Los Angeles County Coastal Zone uh, LCP. That's where it started. Since then, we have worked with Ventura County and Sonoma County on similar measures in their LCPs. Uh, they were revising their, their LCPs at the time. We're now working with the Laguna Beach uh, Environmental Committee and City Council on the same thing. So this is what happened. Uh, this is how this has been spreading. Uh, as we've been told, there has already been extensive consideration of this topic in October 2022. It wasn't just introduced, it was really finalized uh, at that time. There were superb presentations at that time from the California Wildlife Center. We brought out the troops, the National Park Service had input, uh, and we, and we uh, Poison Free Malibu, gave a presentation on the problems. Um, also, there was input from a number of citizens. The Coastal Commission staff had a letter, Department of Pesticide Regulation. In other words, full discussion from all angles. Um, Richard gave a good report at that time, too, reporting on the input from the Zoracis Committee, which covered the same thing. It was one hour and nine minutes total uh, time. So what we'd like to say is that this has been already concluded. The only pur purpose of rehashing it tonight is just to move the language that Bruce created at that time into this document that Richard just told us about, this interpretation document. So we'd appreciate it if there was, that we're claiming that much discussion is really not needed. I do have to say that the staff report was a little kind of hard to understand. I, it's, it could have been clearer, and we're, no one's more familiar with it than, than, than us, and we had a little hard time. And so we don't, we don't want to say we agree with everything in it without going into, into detail. That there's thing, we want to go on the record that we don't agree with some points in it. Um, this might have been more appropriate as a consent calendar item, actually. Um, going forward, we do realize that there, this is just the start of this process, the document that Richard uh, mentioned is where the details are contained. Not just indoor versus outdoor, by the way. There, there are other details in that document. Um, 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 
So um, this is what approval of the interpretation allows. The city can protect our environmental resources based on what we know here in Malibu. That, that is given to us. That's what the Coastal Commission staff said to us over and over. You people determine what, what you want development to be. You determine how you want to control it. We have the, the power. So Thank please you, do pass it. Pat, you're up. Good evening, Council. I'm speaking tonight for the Malibu Coalition for Slow Growth. You all have our comments, so I'm not going to reach them, but I think the staff interpretation is very, very vague, and I think that has to be expanded on. Uh, number one, I would say that the, for the staff who's not familiar with LCP um, or LUP uh, 318, that should be put in the interpretation in its entirety. The second thing is it's vague in the interpretation as to what the staff is going to outreach for. And on page four of the staff report, staff says it very, very well. It says, if adopted, staff should conduct extended and continuing educational outreach to businesses, residents, pesticide operators, companies, gardener shopping centers, chamber of commerce, and other entities and organization, notify, notify, notifying them of the policy and educating them as to the harm created by pesticides and offering alternatives. And that should be put in, I, I believe, so everybody's clear on what, what, they're, what they have to do, to who they have to outreach to. And the other thing that I think has to be made clear is that if anyone wants to um, use a toxic pesticide, they have to get a coastal development permit. And, um, and if they don't, they're subject to um, they're in violation, and, and also, if there's a condition of approval in the coastal development permit that they don't adhere to, they're subject to enforcement. So those are my additional thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Do we have Zoom comments? There are three raised hands. First, we'll hear from Doug Carstens. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Honorable Council Members. My name is uh, Douglas Carstens. I'm here on behalf of the Poison Free Malibu, a community organization dedicated to eliminating rodenticide threats to Malibu's wildlife. We submitted a letter last Thursday, which I'd like to highlight. The main point is that you have already fully reviewed and considered the issues of pesticides in the coastal zone and have commendably made several commitments to prohibit pesticide use. We're concerned that the staff report prepared on June 28th does not accurately reflect the fact that this issue was fully considered by the City Council during the October 10, 2022 City Council meeting, and instead it attempts to revisit an issue that has already been fully addressed by the City Council. While we discuss substantive points in our letter, including the prior discussion, interpretation policy, and the Council motion, we do not believe substantive debate needs to be undertaken now again. Accordingly, we urge the City Council to take public comments, but then to close discussion of the agenda item and approve the item forthwith without further discussion or revisions. Thank you for your consideration of these comments. Thank you. Next is Joe Drummond, followed by Ryan. Hi again. Um, if this is the LCP proposal that is going to eliminate poison that will stop our wildlife and our water and our health from getting affected, then please just pass it. I think it's great that the city has not used pesticides on their own property for many years. So let's just do it for all of Malibu. And that's it. I'm sure you guys will. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Ryan. I support the intended action, but I want to take this opportunity to call your attention that this is going to be a permanent and ongoing and most likely an escalating uh, need for the city staff to do a public outreach campaign. And this may be ads in the paper or postcards at the right times of the year. 
Um, or maybe you could subscribe to the change of ownership uh, through some company and send a postcard, welcome to Malibu and don't poison the neighborhood. So there is a provision that is an override to uh, this prohibition. And I want to, to have you be cognizant of that is if the city gets inundated by an infestation of rodents, the plan is to revert back to these poisons. So we need to make sure we never get there. So you have to stay on top of this. You have to do the enforcement of the dumpster lids. You have to have a permanent program of staff to make this work. And because if it fails, it reverts back to the old, we gotta do it, we just gotta do it because what we tried didn't work. And we cannot fail at this. This is too important for Malibu. So please make sure that you assign the resources, that you ensure that it's done, that you have a continuum of this education and enforcement. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Are there anybody else's yeah. raise their hand? Those are all the raise hands. Great, that, that concludes public comment, brings it back to council. Uh, I'm gonna do something unusual. I wanna, I wanna start off by asking, before we even have any discussion, I mean, I'll make a comment, first of all, the former city council did unanimously um, direct the staff to put this forward. Um, I have some very minor word changes I wanna make, but my question to the council is, is there anybody here that objects to this before we even have any discussion? Because if, if there isn't, it'll save me a lot of comments. I just want some clarification on a couple of points since I wasn't party to the uh, prior discussion. Anybody else? Okay. Because I, ha I have a lot of explanation that I can make, but Doug, let's hear your questions and see if that doesn't, uh, wh whether that gets us on to unan unanimity or uh, whether there's an issue. Well, I think it's more uh, clarification for me than anything else. Um, I mean, it's hard, it's, it's impossible to oppose this. I mean, let's be candid about it. But I want to make sure that we know what we're approving. Um, for example, one of the first questions I had when I went back and read this again, and I was somewhat cognizant of what took place before, but I didn't read it in the same depth. What's the definition of these products? Because um, I, I think I've seen things where you can, on YouTube, where you can use ammonia and uh, Dawn and use that as a herbicide. You know, are we, are we taking uh, grandma's uh, solution and now making it illegal to use? Or is this a defined product that we're able to say, you know, this is, this is the chemical content you can't use? I, I, what I don't want to do is have people inadvertently uh, doing something that they think is a, a green step turning into something that's not. So do we have a, how's our definition set for this? Richard, Richard? Can, you, can you tackle that? In the past materials, and I'm sorry, I, Poison Free Malibu could probably speak to this a lot better than I could. Um, there, it, I want to say it might be, am I drawing the wrong word here, a CAS? There, there is a, the state of California has identified these chemicals, and it's actually in our previous staff report on the matter. I, I could so there is, a, there is a schedule for it, and it's, it's not just us saying herbicides or adenocides. Um, let me see if Richard's got the answer first, but. but I, I'd have to look it up for you, but I believe in our previous report, um, we labeled, uh, we referred to how the state of California identifies these particular chemicals. Okay. Uh, Pat or uh, whoever, just just tell me quickly, if you could. Come up, come up to the, come up to the microphone, please. If you speak from back at the seats, that's not part of the public record yeah. because no one will be able to hear it yeah, on the, YouTube. Yeah, so come, yeah. come up to the, uh, the podium, please. Um, yes, this was reviewed in, in great detail uh, with Richard and uh, his department about what would be acceptable and what is not acceptable. Uh, accordingly to the Earth Friendly Management Policy that's stated right now, um, pesticides that are not um, uh, acceptable are the category one, two, and three. Uh, we have a category four that is an EPA exempt category. And these will be allowable to be used 
by the public, by the pesticide uh, companies. Uh, they are considered to be uh, uh, eco they are eco-exempt because they are not considered a, um, a da as damaging uh, to, as these chemicals, the one, two, and three uh, uh, pesticides are categorized as. So yes, uh, they can be using these outside. Uh, there's a huge list that's available. Okay. Uh, uh, it was, uh, it's, it's within our earth-friendly management policy. It's there also. And uh, also there's a lot of antidotal uh, type of information that, that is out there uh, that uh, is eco-friendly and organic. And that's also available. We work very hard on our, our earth-friendly management um, website. We have a repel, exclude, deter section uh, that could be referred to by the public. We've been working for at least one year now with Chris or, or Rosie uh, uh, with the Parks and Rec. He's extremely um, intelligent and um, well organized. And we've been working since at least a year now on outreach projects for the public how we're going to do this, how we're going to uh, expand uh, the public uh, awareness of the problems with pesticides. So we have been working very hard on this uh, uh, with outreach already uh, okay. with the city. All right. Thank you. Kim. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I just wanted a little clarification as to what, oh, what the box looked like. Any yes, further questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, a couple, a couple more well, very quickly. Um, this applies uh, on development uh, permits that we grant, that applies to residential and commercial. It's not just commercial, correct? This interpretation would apply, correct, residentially and commercially, okay. or industrially, <laughs> if we have that, uh, followed by, uh, I, I, this is in addition uh, to staff has already been putting a condition of approval on coastal development permits right. that have been issued by the city. So that, that has already been happening. That's been happening for a number of years now. This is taking this one step further uh, so that properties, properties that do not have city issued permits with that condition would fall under this. They would now be affected by this. Okay, now here's my follow-up question to this. Uh, enforcement. It's easy to say that uh, we've got a, uh, an LIP uh, ordinance, I guess the right word for this, um, but how do, we, how do we know somebody's violated it and how do we enforce it? Because it's, it, it makes everybody feel good when you pass a law, but it doesn't do any good if you don't enforce it. So how are we gonna enforce it? Richard or whoever? Can, can I suggest an answer, which is, I mean, it's the same thing as if your neighbor begins to put a deck up without having a permit. So it's, it's your a Your next complaint. year neighbor will let the city know. It's that complaint, you, complaint that, oriented. That yeah. you're doing yeah. something that you do not have a permit to do. All right. And then uh, lastly, I understand that uh, the state um, may not agree with the uh, local coastal uh, interpretations. Where do we stand on that? Because I believe that was a couple years ago there was an issue about that. Sure. This is something that's been discussed, I think, um, with previous councils in, in, in some great depth. There are a number of arguments um, that based on um, state law preemption that prohibits local jurisdictions from regulating pesticides in any form. And the argument that's been put forward is that the Coastal Act um, and its implementing terms, if we make changes through um, our LCP that it would not be um, prevented from that we would be able to regulate pesticides through that context. So um, I don't want to get too far into this. I, I think I've shared some legal analysis about um, the risks that could be involved in this. Um, there is a department of, of, that is specifically that is specifically tasked with enforcing those provisions and we've heard from them on occasion here. I don't believe they have any correspondence tonight. Um, but they have um, appeared and they, they, they could take some kind of action against the city. They haven't done so, so far. Okay. The city is, well, I guess I'll leave it at that. All right, which brings me to my um, example question. Recently, we had an issue at uh, Point Doom, the state parks. Uh, did we have the authority to enforce them not using that or was that on a um, uh, friendly basis that they agreed not to use the herbicides they were using? I believe they voluntarily made that choice. 
at this point in time. But do we have authority um, under our plan, under what we're passing tonight, do we have the authority to require them to get us a CDP? I would, I would, I would look, I would want to look closely into the, exactly their rules and regulations for their specific department before giving you advice okay. about that. All right. I, that was more for guidance in the future. That's uh, all my questions. Okay. Well, I'm going I'm to make a motion that we approve this. Um, is there a second? I'll second, but I've got a question. Yeah, there's, we'll, we'll still have discussion. So Miriam was up next for discussion. I, I was just going to follow up on that specific one. Um, State Parks had a CDP issued by us for that particular project. So was that condition prior to our adoption of this interpretation? We don't have, we haven't adopted this interpretation. Well, That's the proposal but Richard tonight. said that they were adding this language to CDPs for several years. So did this happen to fall under that one? The state park CDP for the, the restoration of the uh, Point Doom Headlands, uh, that one was issued prior to the policy being uh, adopted. So, um, one amendment to my own motion. The interpret, if, if people look at attachment one, the interpretation, actually, I, I would like to strike the issue because I feel that there are potentially words in the description of the issue that could be deemed to be legislative history that we have not previously discussed and don't need in an interpretation. This is attachment one? Yes, it's the very last page. I, I think we simply need an interpretation. We don't need a statement of an issue. And I would also suggest that we strike the words council considers the. It's just our interpretation is the use of pesticides, dot, dot, dot. Um, so that the mo if Steve, will we accept that as an uh, amendment? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so the motion is that we adopt this interpretation, which is that the use of pesticides, including insecticides, herbicides, rodenticides, and any other similar toxic chemical substances uh, is, not to be, is development as used in LIP section 13.3, where the application of such substances would have the potential to significantly degrade environmentally sensitive habitat areas, paran esha, or coastal water quality or harm wildlife. Such development is also not considered to be maintenance under LIP section 13.42, and therefore a coastal development permit is required prior to such use. This policy does not apply to the indoor use of such substances. I, I would actually say if, if, if we wanted make it a lot easier and say the outdoor use of pesticides and then strike the last sentence altogether. Um, just a few words. Um, first of all, Keon, Joel, thank you for all the hard work over all these years that you've put into this. I know there have been a lot of other members of the community that have done this, but, but you've been leading the charge. And Pat, the work you do for the environment, not just here, but in, in all areas, is, is, is greatly appreciated and I think goes unthanked a lot of times. So thank you, thank you all. Um, the, um, there have been a number of statements about this prohibiting pesticides. It does not, uh, to make that clear, this, this will simply require a CDP in order to use them. A prohibition is what is going to come from the LIP amendment that we have not yet put forward and that we have directed the staff to propose to us. And with that, I'll say I understand we're understaffed on many areas and that the staff has a lot to do, but we do need the LIP proposal, the, the LCP amendment, um, to button this up. The, um, and there, there was a lot of legal commentary that I had last time that I don't think I'm going to need to go through this time. But um, so that, the motion, let, let, Steve, if it's okay, the, the motion is, Take out the last sentence, make it the outdoor use of pesticides, and then all the other language I read before. I don't have a problem with that either. Okay. Is there any further discussion? Yes. Marianne. Um, with regards to that subject, I would encourage at least having some language in there so that a future council or future people don't think that staff just came up with this, that, they, that it was the council that directed this interpretation. I think it's just good for historical perspective so people know the genesis of it. Well, why don't we call it council LCP interpretation? City council LCP interpretation. Can we do that? That work? So if I understand correctly and just uh, on this 
the underlying bold print there, write the word council above. City council, yes. City council above. Trevor, do you see any issue with that? It'd be different than the others in the manual, but. Where is the change going into? The, the title. The title. And you just wanted to say city council? Yeah. City council LCTP interpretation. I just want some historical reference so that there isn't any confusion. Um, not, not that, you know. Uh, better. How, how about we just have a preamble before the interpretation that says on July 10, 2023, the city council approved the following interpretation. How does that work for you? That works. Fine. Steve, will you accept that I'll as a friendly amendment? Yes. Okay. So we'll strike the issue. We'll include that sentence I just stated. The interpretation will then be the outdoor strike council considers the rest of the language is there, um, except also strike. Um, Oh, where it says to be development, it should be is development. And then strike the last sentence. So that's the motion. Any further comments? Yes. You're taking out the, the policy does not apply to the indoor uses? Right, because we're going to put in the word outdoor at the very beginning. The outdoor use. Okay. Okay. Marianne? Um, so I just have a couple things. Uh, with regards to processing uh, the CDPs, um, does the staff need to hire any consultants or staff members that are experts in the um, use and application of pesticides to assist with the review of the required CDPs? I believe that it would be prudent that we have some, we'll have to look at uh, what the city biologist is familiar with, but Yes, we may look to our one of our consultants to see if we could find somebody who has a better understanding of those chemicals and their application to work with the city biologist because uh, the policy is tied to uh, essentially disruption to wildlife and our ecosystem. So it would be something we'd work with our city biologist on. So I'd like to recommend that we um, direct a contract to either hire a consultant or a staff member that has that subject matter expertise? I don't know that we can do that tonight as part of the agendized item, Trevor. That's fine, or bring it back so that we have support staff for this. The direction is to have staff bring back a future item to, uh, to um, hire a to bring options or to bring a contract for, for someone with that expertise? I just want to make sure that we have somebody that staff can rely on to provide them the expert guidance well, in order to uh, make this as successful as possible. So maybe direct staff to, um, to research the issue and bring back a, a recommendation for the hiring of a person if necessary? Would it, would it work to just let the city manager Figure try to work this out to the best he can and if he can't, he can come back to the council with a request for assistance? Fine with me. I just want to make sure it's done so that we don't cause undue hardship and we have successful implementation of these CDPs. Got it. And I, as I understand it, I think you want to make sure that staff has somebody who has the expertise to be able to, to do that evaluation. I think, as, as Richard said, if we'll talk to the city biologist, if, if, if we do not feel that that person can do that, then we'll, we'll look at bringing in somebody to, uh, to enhance that and, and assist with that. If, okay. if you need to, you may have if the discretionary to. authority right. to just do it on your own. Right, and we'll report to council what the outcome of that is. Okay. Is that good? That's great. Okay, good suggestion. Thank other, you. Other comments? Other or? comments? Too. Right. So the other um, is with regards to education and outreach to the public. I think that the, the city should um, seriously consider hire a professional PR firm. Um, in order to expand. I think that one of the things that we've struggled with in the city across a lot of our environmental issues and just issues in general is not being able to reach a lot of those uh, property owners that we have here. And I think with the subject um, as um, 
important as this one that we do as much canvassing and get it out, you know, uh, to a lot of the large landowners that, you know, maybe aren't involved in our schools, maybe aren't involved in some of other public outreach things and to come up with some different um, messaging to make sure that we're reaching every possible person that's going to be affected by this. So again, we make this as accessible as possible. Any other comments? Quick question. Because of the changes we made, are we going to have to bring this back again, or is this done tonight? No. Done. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. Just a couple of questions. I agree with everything we've done. I just got a couple of questions not Go ahead. on this. Uh, outreach, Richard. What does the outreach program currently look like? How are we going to do this? At this time, uh, the plan was to start it with code enforcement reaching out to the commercial centers. This is a plan similar to what we've done. Uh, our code enforcement manager has reached out to commercial property owners in the city regarding the locking dumpsters ordinance. Okay. So that will be the initial start. Uh, moving forward though, we do need to f develop a further uh, a plan to notify homeowners, uh, property owners, better term to use, throughout the city. So that is something we'll be working to How do. How are you gonna notify all these companies that currently do rodent removal. They're all over the place. Some have reached out to the city, uh, who I, I forget the name of the company uh, that works, uh, that covers uh, the Ralph Shopping Center, but some have reached out, uh, but it'll be something that hopefully we can identify through the commercial property owners. These, these guys do in residential properties? Uh, the residential, um, there Here's seem my to concern. be just, I mean, just yep. execution has been a problem of ours. We don't execute very well. I mean, I'll take the dark sky program. We still don't have anybody. I get six gas stations, at least five of which are not enforced anyplace, right? They're not in compliance. Uh, and I have no idea where we're going with the uh, commercial properties on it. So my, con my concern, I think what we need to see is a, in, in, you know, you may have one, okay? How are we going to reach out to the people and let them know what the heck's going on with this thing so, there, so there's some outreach? We don't have a plan right now, as best I can tell. And we've got, we're gonna do this, maybe do this, maybe do this, but I would think since we're going out with this thing, and this thing is enforceable t tomorrow morning, right? That is correct. And okay, I mean, this, this is now, we can start enforcing this thing, but we gotta let people know what the heck's going on, and I think we need a written plan to do that which we don't have. Correct. So and I, I'm just suggesting, Steve, if, you, if we're going to do this, let's put a plan together so everybody knows how we're going to do it. We can take a look at it, and maybe you could bring that plan back so at some point just so we can take a look at that thing. Second thing, what does enforcement look like? I go out to this homeowner, and he's using one of these pesticides. How, how does enforcement work? Uh, as mentioned earlier, it would be along the lines of what we do with construction of a deck. Uh, Doug, would, our co enforcement manager, would implement essentially the same practice. It would be to seek the removal of uh, whatever bait box. Um, I, okay, I know it's going to be hard to seek removal if someone sprays a chemical on the ground. These houses now, they're using a pesticide, and we I can identify that that's going on. Code enforcement is going to go to his house and do what? Uh, they're going to ask for the removal of the item. Okay, and like you said, very difficult to remove if it's in the ground. Well, I'm just trying to... They're, I would assume they're going to give them a cease and desist letter and tell them if they do it again, we're going to go... We're going to apply administrative it's, penalties and it's, eventually it's, go to court. And that's what, I'd like, and that's what I'd like to hear. All right, I'm just... I'm not hearing that. That's my problem. So as I mentioned, it would be our standard practice, which would be to... Requ request for the removal. Now I understand that's going to be hard to do if somebody sprayed something on the ground because it's already been sprayed. Uh, and I don't think we want them washing it because that'll that'll further its contamination. Uh, we'll ask that uh, it stop or if it's something that can be removed like a bait box we'll seek its removal. Uh, if that does not happen then that's when they, Doug would then follow our practice uh, of it, going through the citation process, it'll be documented. Um, if we get called out there in a month, uh, that you know that way we identify someone who's a repeat offender, so it's not just a warning every month. 
So how many warnings do you get before you, there's a penalty? It is a request to remove it, so I would say once. And if it's not removed, uh, then that is when code enforcement then will uh, go for the citation process. But we seek compliance first. We document it regardless, uh, because as I mentioned, we're, we don't want to be in a situation where we're getting called out there every month and it's, oops, sorry. Um, if we get called out there, it's documented. Doug makes a note of that through the code enforcement files and we seek compliance. Okay, and I just want to go back to one thing the mayor mentioned. You, you suggested that if a neighbor finds somebody using this, they can report their neighbor as having done this. Is that? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's the way it works now. There have been issues over the years about whether the city ought to require somebody to report it or whether as a, as a precondition to going out or whether it ought to be something that could be proactively done anyway. But the current way it's done, as I understand it, is a complaint has to be lodged by somebody and then the city will investigate. And that complaint has to be, the complainer has to be identified, correct? Uh, per the council policy, yes. Okay, so that's going to prevent. So we can we can reconsider that policy. I, I, may I decide to leave it the way it is, or may decide to change it. But that's not for tonight. Okay, I'm, look, I'm just trying to make sure that if we're going to go through the effort of doing this, we have some positive results when we get to the end, because we have traditionally been lax in, in making that happen. So, okay, I'll, that's yeah, all I got. I mean, so, look, look, the only issue tonight is the interpretation. I understand. The, L, the our municipal code section 1.10 sets forth the manner by which violations are addressed. 1.16 also applies, and um, it's really not for us here to micromanage the city's enforcement of its enforcement mechanisms unless and until a real problem arises. With, let's not prejudge this and assume there's going to be a problem. Let's just adopt the interpretation if that's where we're headed and hopefully it will then become a remedied situation. And if it's not, it becomes a problem. It'll have to be addressed. Yeah, I'm not trying to micromanage it. I'm just trying to make sure there's some management in place, micro or some yeah. type, well, all right? The process that we currently have until we, change the, until we change the council policy is that a complaint has to be lodged and apparently the complainant needs to be identified. And yeah. I personally have a problem with that, but that's the policy we currently have. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm done. Okay, you got it. Paul, did you have any comments before we vote? My only comment is that the uh, the local garden and hardware stores and markets will learn about this pretty quickly, what products they're not supposed to be selling in Malibu. And after that, uh, all the pesticide companies that have services drive around in trucks with their name on the side. It's not hard to tell that they're showing up. So unless they've got something on the side that says all our treatments are compliant with the city of Malibu, simply seeing them on, in the location is enough to cause questions. So I, I think that this is not going to be perfect from the beginning. Nothing ever is. And I'm sure we will find loopholes that are being exploited and we'll close them. So let's go for it. Right, and, and before we just, I, I promised Trevor also, just, you know, just so everyone understands, I, we, we, we're doing this with our eyes wide open. The three issues, there are three issues that may or may, or may not be raised. It'll, one will be whether it's a proper interpretation, interpretation of the word development. One is whether it's a proper interpretation of the word maintenance. And the other is whether there is or is not preemption by the um, state law that deals with the um, pesticides and, and other chemicals. Um, but we have the discretion to make these determinations and we'll find out in the future if we're right or we're wrong if somebody challenges it just like we'll, anything else we do Could we call the question please mayor silverstein yes mayor pro tem Uri? yes councilmember grisanti yes councilmember briggins yes councilmember stewart yes motion carries Thank you. Thank you. okay thank you that's okay. Thank you, Keon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that takes us to uh, ten minute break, please. That takes us to ten minute break. <laughs> Thank you. We can't get sure. these done in ten minutes. I, we probably can, but let's take a ten minute break. Very fine. You think you can get this done in ten minutes? No, I think it's more like twenty to thirty. Okay.
Did I say that loud enough? No. <laughs> it's showtime. Okay, we are back. 6A, update local coastal program amendment number 21-002, Malibu and, Malibu and High School campus specific plan. Please raise your hand in Zoom if you'd like to speak on this item and you'll be called after the staff report since I have no cards. Is there a staff report? Yes, I will give a quick update for the benefit of the council. So on this coming Wednesday, the Coastal Commission is going to hear an item by coastal staff regarding a request by coastal staff to uh, process a one-year extension for their consideration of the, of the local coastal program amendment for the Malibu High, High School specific plan. The the purpose of this item is for us to uh, submit a letter. We have a draft letter attached to your agenda package. This letter would be sent as correspondence to the Coastal Commission, citing our objection and the importance of processing the amendment uh, as it holds up the project. In addition, uh, I have filled out a speaker slip to speak on Wednesday on this matter at the Coastal Commission hearing, uh, unless, of course, there's uh, other direction from the council. And also wanted to alert the council that letters of opposition have started to, um, uh, excuse me, have been received by the Coastal Commission. Uh, there's a, I, I, this morning and going through the package sent to me by Coastal staff, and there were letters of objection from some of the high school students. There was also a, a letter of objection from the school district, as well as a letter from Senator Ben Allen's office and Senator Jackie Irwin's office. Uh, that has all been forwarded to the Coastal Commission, uh, uh, commissioners, excuse me. Uh, if there are any questions, I'd be glad to address those. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any Zoom speakers? No, we don't have any raised hands on Zoom. Okay. Um, I'll move that we approve the letter. Um, I have one proposed change to it, though. I think it ought to be signed by the city manager or the mayor, not the assistant city plan planning director. So that's my motion in a minute. Motion. I'll second it. Um, but I do have one quick question. What is the basis that they're asking for this one-year delay, just that they can't get to it, or they have some problem? They, uh, in our discussions with coastal staff, it's been cited as staff resources. They have, we've asked them a number of times for some sort of feedback. Is it good? Is it bad? Are you going to have modifications? Uh, but we have not received any feedback from them. I, I had a conversation with um, the supervisor staff about this issue, about seeing if they would support this as well. And um, basically, this is the way we explained it. it it's just like when the city gets a public records request, the first thing the city does is automatically say 14 day extension or whatever it is. The first thing they do when they get a request for something like this is one year extension. Okay. Steve? Uh, th I just wanted to pick up on the mayor's suggestion. I think uh, if the council approves this uh, letter, I think it would be appropriate if it was signed by the mayor. I think that would probably have the, the most impact. Okay, so motion, was there a second? I did. Doug, so any further discussion? Just one, you know, one of the biggest arguments I've heard for this is the additional amount of money it's going to cost. Okay. Uh, and I just don't see that listed anyplace. I'm just wondering, I mean, maybe you can do it in your comments versus putting in the letter, but 
boy, you know, this thing is going to cost the school district a ton of money. I, because it I didn't see it. Yeah, it's, it's, there's, no, there's no figure stated, but right. it's in the second full paragraph. That's what the paragraph's about. The yeah, specific no plan, money, right? That, right. It just, it just says that right. it's being funded by a general obligation bond and that it will significantly increase the cost. Okay. I mean, the numbers that we've put forth are, are high. So, okay. I believe last time around I, I mentioned that uh, the cost increase since we did the uh, bond is over 30% increase yeah, in construction costs in this last year have been astronomical. Right. So this is, they're just chewing into our ability to build the school to the point that it may not get built the way we think. Well, do we, do we want to include in the motion that the city manager has discretion to make some additional wordsmith changes to put numbers in if, if Or if Richard, if, if he's or, going to do his presentation to the Coastal Commission, just make sure you, you, you incorporate the fact that there's a huge financial impact if they delay this thing. That's be okay. Yeah, it, I mean, it, the letter says it has the potential to render the project financially infeasible. In the, next to last. in the next to last paragraph, it already says that the project has already incurred costly delays because of the need, because of the Woolsey fire and COVID-19 pandemic. Not only does this one year extension to act on the LCPA affect the implementation of phase one, but it also affects the later phases of the specific plan already. Are there any further comments or should we vote? Okay, roll call please. Mayor Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Wiggins? Yes. Mayor Pro Tamirin? Yes. Motion carries. Excellent. Last item for tonight is 6B, amendment number one to the employment agreement for the city manager services between the city of Malibu and Stephen L. McClary. Uh, if you're on Zoom and you'd like to speak, raise your hand. There are, again are no speaker slips. Is there a staff report? I can make a brief report. Okay. So um, as the council is aware, um, Mr. McClary was hired as the, the uh, permanent city manager a little over a year ago, and since that time, um, he's been working hard in the city and accomplishing a lot of um, great things here. And um, over that period of time, he has not been eligible for the, the standard increases that everyone else in staff gets as a, as a COLA every year. And um, as a result, his compensation has, has not kept up with uh, inflation or with other comparable city managers in the area. So this amendment would, uh, would provide for a raise, which is um, something that the council does consider every year for the city manager. It does not build in a COLA, uh, but it does increase his, his compensation and his car allowance. So if there are any questions, happy to take them. But um, this is, a, this is a, an amendment to uh, reflect uh, hard work. Does any member of council have a question before we see if there's public comment? Is there any Zoom comment? There's one, one raised hand from Ryan. I was going to guess it would be Ryan. <laughs> yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> You're on, I want to say, um, you know, I've, I've worked with every city manager that this city's ever had. There have been some good ones and some great ones, and there have been some bad ones. And Steve McClary has done a very good job for this city. He came in under very difficult circumstances, if you recall. He was the interim to serve while the city was in a pickle. So that's one. Uh, he's never lost his cool in public, and there have been city managers who've lost their cool before for very good reasons. But I do want to say, that the car allowance gives the city council an opportunity to affect one of its goals of sustainability. Now, this is a very generous uh, proportion of increase over 50% to well over $600 of a monthly stipend. And it, it does not require, however, that the city manager get or buy a new vehicle or a sustainable vehicle or a reliable vehicle. So if, if he wants to drive a 25 year old Jaguar to work every day and see if he gets here, that's you know a thing, but there's nothing in this, this agreement that implements even the provision for the vehicle. He could take public transportation to the city every day and he'd still receive this. So 
the, it says the intent. You could change the word in the contract to something other than intent, or you could make the raise to the uh, generous amount of $625 a month contingent that the vehicle be a hybrid vehicle or a sustainable vehicle. Uh, but that is your choice. But I wanted to recommend that you condition that if you move forward with the vehicle allowance, which I think is one of the most generous. Uh, this city manager in Calabasas bought a Tesla and city had a charger for it. You know, you could get one, put in a charger and make it free to the city manager. You know, I could care less. But the city has a chance to do that and should also reconsider its um, solar collection project for the rear parking lot, whether it's a big dome or if it's simply carports over the stalls. That would be a great source uh, and an outdoor area which would become environmentally um, contained for emergency use in inclement weather if you were to so do that. So I think those two should go together and I support the action. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Anyone else raise your hand on Zoom? Those are all the raised hands. All right, that concludes public comment. Brings us back to council. Who has comments? Marianne? I'll make a motion to approve the item. Amendment number one to the employment agreement for city manager services between the city of Malibu and Stephen L. McClary. Paul? I'll second it, and I'll, but with the remark that I'm I'm sorry that Steve has never shown me his Jaguar. <laughs> uh, now I, I hope Steve can afford to and wants to buy a Tesla or something really nice. But after this, but we're not going to require that, obviously. Um, I just want to say I we I think we all agreed. Um, Steve came into a very difficult situation. Um, he, he filled a void during a pandemic post Woolsey fire uh, and did a great job of keeping the lights on, keeping the trains running during that period when that's exactly what we needed. And um, now the challenge is gonna be to move the city forward as opposed to simply keeping the city moving. And um, we're hopeful and optimistic that that is going to occur. In the, as time goes by. And uh, we were very pleased to vote to um, approve this, uh, well, to put this together as a proposal that we would vote for tonight. And uh, we hope Steve is happy with it. Any other comments? Roll call. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Uring? Yes. Mayor Silverstein? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. We are adjourned. We are good.